most incredible place. The world connected in a thousand ways. Television has become very ambitious, and National Geographic, as a network, is embracing that. People are going to see amazing things from us here. Right here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope all of you had a good lunch. Yes. That's good. Well, you'll need this energy because we're going to take a journey into the Okavango Delta. So Steve Boyce earlier this morning told us about this spectacular, magical land. And last October, when I was uh, September, when National Geographic talked about it and asked me to go and film this virtual reality video for them, I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> You've got those special headsets on your chairs. Please don't do anything with them. Don't touch any buttons. Just keep them on your laps. <laughs> they might self-explode. <laughs> Wes is going to come in in just a second and tell you exactly what to do. But um, virtual reality is something completely new, something completely uh, understood only by the gaming generation, the really young generation. So I had no idea what we were planning to do in the Okavango, do a VR video about this incredible landscape. Since I had no idea what they were talking about, I said, OK, <laughs> let's do it. And we teamed up with um, Eric Potter, a sound recordist from Hollywood, LA, and Sam Wilson, who had some experience with VR videos. And the three of us went out into the Okavango, met the incredible team of the Okavango Wilderness Trust, and then we um, headed out into 18 days in a Mokoro across the Delta. And that was a very magical experience for me, personally. And although we were having a lot of trouble with the actual technology, we felt like leaving it underwater most of the time. <laughs> but we managed to come back here with some um, pretty amazing imagery, imagery, I'm sure, that you'll enjoy. And we couldn't have done it without the amazing team that's out there in the field. I think Mr. Water is hiding from me because his daughter is with him. Mr. Water? Oh, finally I see you. Yes. So without Mr. Water, yes. He was my eyes and ears into the field. Because with this technology, I mean, Tracy is about as far as I can get with the camera. You know, if anyone in two rows down, that, yeah, it's too far. So the whole challenge was getting the camera into the right positions to capture the images. And Mr. Water was instrumental, fundamental, in getting that camera in the right places. And I really enjoyed working with him and, of course, the entire team, Chris, Steve, um, Kai, uh, Kyle, Gertz, all of them are here in the audience. And you can ask them lots of questions at the end of it. But before further ado, I'd like to get, um, uh, get Wes Della Voya, Della Vola my Italian friend, <laughs> on stage. Thank you, Wes. Hi, everyone. As Sandesh said, I am Wesley Delavola, Director of Lab Events here at National Geographic Society. And you are sitting in the world's largest virtual re permanent virtual reality theater, which is also now a Webby Award-winning theater. <laughs> so what you're about to experience is what we call virtual reality exploration. And like any good exploration or expedition, there's a few things you have to go through in your pre-departure checklist before you set out in the field. You've got your tools. You need to know how to use them. So first thing, before we jump into the tools, if at any point you experience any discomfort, simply remove your headset. 
once you put it on, which is not yet. <laughs> Big thing, not yet. So if you feel any discomfort, just go ahead, take it off. If your headset needs assistance, let's say it's not working, which we'll go through shortly, just raise your hand. We're going back to grade school. Raise your hand quietly, and there's VX staff that will be in the back that will come replace your headset and give you one that works. So again, just raise your hand quietly. We don't want to disturb your neighbors who are enjoying an amazing experience going down the Okavango River. And then, of course, like any good ride, please remain seated at all times. <laughs> This is for your safety and for that of your neighbor who you'll probably fall into. I know we're all mostly friends here, but we'd like to stay that way. So again, once you put the headset on, not yet, you'll see this. You'll see the Spaces logo. This is actually our partner who helped create the software that makes this experience possible. You'll also notice, most likely, that little angry exclamation point. Ignore it. We know where your controller is. It's in the back, locked in a cage with no battery with all of its 449 friends. You don't need it. We make it so that you just have to put the headset on, and that is it. You'll most likely see this as well, which is, this, again, the Spaces logo. You want it to be crisp and clear once you put the headset on. So to make it crisp and clear, you have to do a few things. This is not like some VR headsets where you have the ability to adjust the lenses. You actually adjust the straps. So these straps here, Velcro and come off on the side. There's also one on the top to make it so it fits vertically on your head. So those of you who have been to one of our virtual reality explorations before, I normally ask who's been scuba diving, who's put on a ski mask. For this audience, I don't know if I actually need to ask that. I feel some semblance of some masks have been put on at some point in your exploration. <laughs> but for the slight chance that you have not, that means you place it on this way first and then pull the strap back. So you may not be able to tell, I have a very large head. <laughs> My mother can also confirm it's really hard. <laughs> and I wear glasses. So if I can put on a headset, anyone should be able to put on a headset. It even strategically goes around hair buns and all kinds of man buns. <laughs> so again, you should have no issue. So again, pull it over. When the time is right, which is not quite yet, so again, you want that logo to be crisp and clear. So now is the time for you to go ahead, put your headsets on. Try not to touch any of the buttons, please. And if you put your headset on, you should see the Spaces logo. It should get crisp and clear as you adjust. If you see anything else, maybe it says, push button to enter VR, raise your hand and we'll give you one that's working. You should see the Spaces logo. You should get it crisp and clear. And as you get that logo crisp and clear, and it looks the way you want, go ahead and take your headset off. We've got a hand up over here in the middle. Raise that hand nice and high. It's dark in here. You want to be able to see your hand. Once you get it crisp and clear, go ahead and take the headset off. That way we know you're ready. So it looks like we've got most of the headsets kind of coming down. All right, again, if you're ready, go ahead, take the headset off. You're going to get plenty of time to go into the headsets and experience the Okavango with a Johnny. So before we bring a Johnny, there's one last thing to remind you. The most important thing, don't forget to look around. Sandesh and the team that made this worked really hard to give you a full 360 experience. There'll be some surprises waiting for you. Look in every angle and every direction and really enjoy the Okavango Delta. And now, without further ado, please bring up a Johnny Costa. I hope you can all hear me very well. Uh, I hope you can all hear me very well. All good? OK. So let's start with this. The Okavango Delta shouldn't really exist. The first time I read about this online, I thought, this is very shocking. But if you think of it, it actually makes sense. Who in their wildest dreams would ever envision a scenario like this in the middle of the desert? Not just any desert, one that means a waterless place or the great thirst, the Kalahari Desert. How ironic can that be? 
The Okavago Delta is a true freshwater oasis that can span to up to 8,500 square miles, almost the size of New Jersey. It is the only permanent body of water in this place, and this water sustains life. Over 2,000 species are registered in the Okavango Delta, including the largest population of African elephants in the world, and over 200,000 mammals. Think of lions, buffalo, wild dog, leopards, giraffes, you name it. It will be there, thriving, just as wild as it was 10,000 years ago. All of this is because of the water that comes to this place. Ten years ago, a team of explorers have decided to survey this land in a way that very few have done before. Equipped with dugout canoes and just the right amount of craziness, the National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project has been crossing the Okavango Delta to try to understand how it works from within. A journey that changes the perception that we as humans have of the wilderness. So your first VR episode is to give you a sense of what it is like to be in such an expedition, so close to the wilderness. So if you could put your headsets on, and like Wes said, if anything goes wrong, just raise your hand. Um, on this one, just try to explore, look around. If you actually look behind you, you will see my brother sitting there, so you're fine. That first moment sitting by myself on an island in the Okavango Delta was the most profound moment of my life. It is, to me, a wilderness beyond comparison. The Okavango Delta is Africa's last remaining pristine wetland wilderness. It is an oasis in the middle of the Kalahari Desert, a sanctuary for the incredible wildlife and biodiversity of this region. A vast patchwork mosaic of channels, floodplains, lagoons, and thousands upon thousands of islands. Here you can find the abundance of life all around you. The annual flood from Angola creates these rich pastures in the Mombo area for animals like the zebra at the driest time of the year. All right, guys. So this is, this is where it starts. Uh, right now is the beginning of the expedition. We've all been preparing, getting our stuff together, getting our minds right, packing, repacking. Our boats are looking great, they're floating, and this is where it all starts. This is the most, most important time to be an explorer, to be a scientist working in these last wild places. What we're doing here on these expeditions are large-scale research transects across the Okavango Delta. We're using things like birds and fish and aquatic insects, aquatic vegetation, the habitat surrounding us, wildlife like elephants and lechwes, as indicators for change across the entire system. We're on the water. We have no engines with us. You're incredibly tired. Your arms are in pain, your shoulders, your feet get very sore, your hands get very sore. And you find yourself transcending that. The 
It's like walking on water. It's flowing, silent, if you're silent, connected. When I'm on the Mokoro, I watch every ripple, every eddy. Everything has to be explained. Every sound. You're connected to everything around you. But it also connects us to the reality of the water. Everything here is water dependent. There's nothing to grab on. It's moving. You're just cutting them in half, eh? Yep. Sometimes we are late, we're unlucky, and the water is gone. So we have to drag across dry land. As we go deeper, we go closer and closer to the sanctuary, to the central wilderness, to the Mombo area, to Madinari. So over the next two days, please be present. We, we're going into a place where animals don't know humans anymore. It's a place that people don't go. So we have to respect this place. We have to respect the animals that are there. It's okay. It's okay. It's very tough to call that place my office. It's very tough. <laughs> um, but some of you might ask, why? Why would someone live the comfort of their house and the deliciousness of their food and the presence of their family to endure physical, emotional, sometimes hormonal drainage for days on end, weeks, sometimes months? Why would someone get out of their couch and be in a Makoro for eight hours Paddling, pushing, pulling, and facing some of their biggest fears. I personally am absolutely terrified of crocodiles. So why would I torture myself that way? The answer is actually quite simple. It's to be humans, but a different type of human. A human that is connected to everything, from the million stars above and the infinite sand below, and everything else in between. A human that goes beyond sight, one that can hear, can feel, can sense, can taste, can almost touch. A human that belongs to the noisy silence of the wilderness, the, that belongs to something so much greater and bigger than himself. <laughs> and as you accept the wilderness, as you accept to be part of the wilderness, the wilderness accepts you back. So you don't just exist, you coexist, you respect and you are respected. And you get to share incredible memories and space with some of the most unbelievable creatures that you know. And they get to share the same space and memories with you. So the next experience, this was just for you to get some rest from that tiring experience you just had. So the next one, hopefully, will give you a sense of what it feels like to be a different type of human, to share your humanity with different species that are quite frankly, stronger than you, but that will respect you the same way. So if you could please put your headsets again for your second episode. This time around, try to go beyond your sight, try to hear everything around you. Just 
pretend that you're there, present on that moment. To have a giant elephant in front of you, interacting with you, connecting with you, smelling you, listening to you, looking at you, telling you to stop, telling you to go away, telling you to stay, I am fine with you. Those interactions are powerful to me. Elephants are the guardians and stewards of this wilderness. This is their home, the living room of Africa. Botswana is home to the world's largest elephant population with almost 140,000 elephants interacting with tourists and local people every day. With no hunting in Botswana, there is no threat, yet there is still conflict. Very few elephants are killed by poachers each year in Botswana, but every year the number of elephants poached increases. More poachers are coming for Botswana's ivory, and we need to be ready. Protect the people, and they will protect the wildlife. We stopped to have lunch at an elephant crossing, not knowing that the migration was about to arrive. This elephant died of natural causes. The tire tracks you can see up to the elephant carcass are from a military vehicle there to remove the tusks for storage. The smell this close to the carcass is unbearable. The lion spent the whole day at the carcass. All attempts to feed were half-hearted, full bellies and the unappetizing smell. Towering above us, as we set up camp for the evening, 
is the Simbira baobab, estimated to be over 2,000 years old. Every evening, I take a moment to sit alone, quietly, and just listen as the delta comes to life. off. You'll have to look at me now, unfortunately. So you <laughs> um, the more time you get to spend in the wilderness, the more you actually start relating to it. In one of those elephant crossing, um, there were two sibling elephants playing with each other, one clearly smaller than the other one. And they were pushing and pulling each other until the smallest one fell into the mud. All of a sudden, it got up, started sprinting towards his mother, yelling to the world, whatever it is. In that moment, I thought, my mother would have loved to see it, because that's exactly what I used to do when I was a child. I couldn't beat my brother, so I would just go and tell mommy. <laughs> so, you, so you start creating this relationship with these creatures, and you start realizing that they are living beings with histories, with a purpose, and whose interactions changes the way the whole dynamics of the system works. But all of this, as I mentioned, depends on the amount of water that flows into the delta. And 95% of that water comes from Angola. See, the Okavango Basin is really big, so big you can actually see it from space. And because the amount of water that comes into the delta has been decreasing with time, the team decided to do something slightly even crazier, which is spend four months in the river from the Quito source, which is one of the main tributaries to the delta, all the way down to the middle of the Kalahari, again, in canoes. 121 days four months to understand how the system changes and how we can use that change to improve existing conservation policies or even create new ones if need be. Ooh, that was wrong. Um, on that expedition, I like to call this picture, where's AJ finding the girl? On that expedition, my job was not just to dilute the testosterone, but actually to study the fish. Um, there was a multinational, multidisciplinary team from scientists to storytellers to journalists because we wanted to look at every possible context and every single perspective and include it in a broad conservation scheme. This expedition to me was not just professional, it was also personal. See, the Quito source is actually located where the epicenter of the Civil War was. 27 years of landmines and conflict in this area kept it isolated for a very long time. And it's a memory that most Angolans still have up to this date, including myself. The movie is going to stream tomorrow at 2.20, in case anyone is interested, but spoiler alert, what we saw, <laughs> in the highlands of Angola, we found this incredible system that keeps the whole basin together. Because it was surrounded by mines and conflict just kept it isolated for so long, it, it was left untouched. So we consider it now to be one of the intact um, Miombo forest in sub-Saharan Africa, holding the water that falls from the rain and keeping it in its peat bog, which holds a lot of water, and then releasing it slowly to the system. So basically working as a sponge that keeps the whole system together. And as we literally dived in, we found a wilderness of its own a universe that functions with its own rules. It is, if the Okavango is seen as a single organism, this place would be the lungs and the heart of it, keeping it together and alive. And the more we got to work with it, if you see in the movie, we hardly saw any wildlife on that expedition, but we went back and we put camera traps. And those camera traps told us that we still have everything. 
from wild dogs to lions to leopards to roan antelopes. If you think of something that should be there, it probably still is, but shy, very afraid because of the consequences of war and hunting. 24 potentially new species to science show how this place is incredible for science and for conservation. But has war created this protection screen for wildlife, created this wildlife hub, it also greatly affected the human communities that are in the system. See, this place was once called the land of hunger because of the extreme conditions uh, that were seen during the Civil War. The local Uchazi people through time have lost their connection with the surrounding environment. They have missed the gap of inheritance for natural belonging. Some of the elders are still aware of it. They still remember the intimate share that they have with nature when they tell us stories about the Mukisi or the Dikisi Kisi, which are the mythical creatures that guard these rivers and forests. But the link to the earlier generations is gone. And while working with these communities through the years, I realized that pure science is not going to do it by itself. So that's when I shifted from taxonomy to working with communities. And that's where my PhD project came together. It is to help them reconnect to their surrounding environments, to give them ownership of their own land, the true guardians of their own land, is to create a community-based natural resource manage management model that looks for their needs, for their beliefs, for their traditions, for their aspirations, for them. They are the center and they are in control of their lives and of their future. It's a community-based natural resource management model that looks at activating conservation from within, where they can have benefits of the wilderness that they belong to and that they can protect for. It's one that provides a better future for young and coming generations of both humans and wildlife alike. One that protects the wilderness by protecting its people, my people. And one that hopefully in the future will help us save this incredible source of life, the backbone of the Okavango Delta. Thank you. Thank you, Adjani. Thank you. Thank you, Adjani. And um, I just wanted to tell you, earlier this year, Steve let me borrow um, one of these headsets when I went back to India. My father was super unwell. He was in the hospital. I took the headset to him at the hospital, put it on him, and the smile on his face it's the closest that I could have taken him to the Okavango and actually feel the experience. He had never seen anything like it, and he really enjoyed it. And so I was supposed to bring your headset back. I haven't gone back home yet, so <laughs> bring it back soon. Um, but like any film, it, it's not a one-person effort. It's a full team of people. And at this moment, I'd like to quickly get the entire Okavango team to please stand up uh, Water, Chris, John, Steve, um, Anand, Anand, where are you? Carlin, Ajani. This. This is my personal way of like thanking all of you to help make this film happen, and I hope all of you enjoyed it. Um, as Wes mentioned, don't take these headsets back with you, right? <laughs> keep them on your chair, and he'll be collecting them in a bit. Just keep them under your seat so we can um, get on with the program. So National Geographic is lucky to partner with a number of different organizations and individuals around the world, many of you in this room, in fact. This next conversation highlights the power of these partnerships. To introduce you to these speakers, I'd like to welcome our moderator to the stage, journalist and National Geographic Explorer, Explorer Laurel Chor. Thank you. 
I'm going to be talking about my family and my home today. Uh, so it would be remiss of me to mention them without talking a little bit about the unrest happening. I can't report on it myself, unfortunately, but the be next best thing I can do is to ask you to take a few minutes to look at what's going on in Hong Kong. So I grew up in Hong Kong, and as a kid, we would eat shark skin soup, mostly on special occasions. My sister especially loved it. I don't. I didn't really think about where it came from, probably in the same way that you didn't really think about where your food came from when you were a kid, too. I don't remember exactly when I decided to stop eating sharks and soup or when I asked my family to, but I do know it's because of the stories I read and the photos I saw and the videos I watched. And now, as a storyteller, I'm trying to change minds, too. This is a photo that I took in Sri Lanka not too long ago. This is my aunt. She, over there in the middle, that's my uncle. He's talking to my mom. And my aunt is showing me where she keeps her expensive dried seafood goods, uh, like fish bladder and manta ray gills. I had, I had no idea that she had these things. She started showing me other things she had. She had cow gallstone, which she takes when she feels headaches that are a remnant of a stroke she had a couple years ago. And to my surprise, she also showed me a small nub of rhino horn that a friend had given her many years ago for a thyroid problem. If you asked the English-speaking internet, they would probably tell you that she were stupid, ignorant, barbaric, a monster. But I know she's not those things. Chinese demand is causing a lot of animals to go extinct. But when we make generalizations about China, this vast, diverse country, it's not helpful. Even for me, I sometimes feel alienated or that I'm being talked about like I'm not there. As a visual storyteller, I've been exploring traditional Chinese medicine, its users, and where the ingredients come from. This photo is from a market in Guangzhou where you can see that the amount of wildlife being sold, in this case seahorses, is absolutely mind-boggling. I'm hoping that my photos can help spark an informed, nuanced, empathetic, compassionate conversation about what's going on. If we're going to solve the environmental crisis, we need to talk to people. We need to invite them to the table, and we need to involve them in our solutions. And we're going to need nuance and compassion and empathy. And that's why I'm so excited about our panel today, because that's exactly what it's about. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dominique Gonzalez. She's an ecologist working at Gorongosa National Park, and she's a National Geographic Fellow. Thank you. Oops, not yet. <laughs> As a Mozambican woman, it's a great honor to be here and to represent my colleagues in Gorongosa National Park. Kurungos is known to some of you as a wildlife restoration success story. In the last decade, our large population, animal population, increased from 10,000 to 100,000. But, thank you. <laughs> but Kurungos isn't only about restoring wildlife. It is also about restoring people's life. When we see our park in a greater landscape and we think about the challenges we face today, we also think about what can we do to ensure that people and wildlife has a, have a healthy and safe future. These are some of the reasons why Gorongos is being successful. First, management. Gorongos is co-managed in a 35-year private-public par partnership between the government of Mozambique and the Greg Carr Foundation. This partnership gives us a lot of independence and flexibility. We can try new things and we can adapt quickly when we see that one idea don't work. Second, conservation and science. Gorongosa face has many other wild places in Africa and around the world, many threats but we have been holding the line. Our rangers reduced po poaching by 72%, and they kept the worst of the illegal wildlife trade at our door. So protection is critical. 
But you can't protect what you don't know you, don't, you have. So we're constantly documenting and monitoring our biodiversity. We want to, we want to know our animals and plant species. We want to understand their relationships and, how, and what benefits they give us. This is what we do at the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Laboratory in Goyongosa. A month ago, we celebrated in recording our 6,000 species, and it's already going more and more. Third, benefits. Simply put, a national park is an opportunity cost to local people. The people can live, farm, or hunt there, and sometimes, the elephants that I study go to their farms and raid their crops. So you have to pay the opportunity cost back to people and give benefits. We provide decent jobs to 650 people, but not everyone can have a job. So we work with the government to deliver health care to people, agricultural assistance to families, and education support, especially for, to, for vulnerable girls. We believe that when we give enough benefits, people listen. And if you listen back, you'll become partners. Fourth, funding. Of course, providing all these benefits is expensive. National parks are often underfunded. So we, part we look for partnerships with organizations, groups that normally don't do conservation, but they focus on human development. These groups want a reliable partner. We have the staff, we have the infrastructure, we know the place, we have strong relationships with the people, with our communities. So it becomes a win-win for everyone. But we don't want to rely on donors forever. We're starting now to think of sustainable financing funding sources. We're growing shade-grown coffee and Mount Goyongosa. It not only helps funding the park programs, but also gives income to the local farmer and helps protect the rainforest at the mountain. Lastly, think long term. You know, we, as I said, we are long term, 35 years. This way, the people know that you're not ju there just one day and gone the next. They engage, they trust you. And you also have to think about climate change. This was brought to home to us on the 9th of March 14th, when Cyclone Idai smashed into Mozambique, taking more than a thousand lives, destroying most of my home city of Beira, and local communities around Gorongosa. During the cyclone, the park absorbed 800,000 you know, Olympic-sized swimming pools of water. Overnight, our entire staff became relief workers. Since then, we, de we have delivered 390 tons of food over to 79,000 people. We're now starting to give seeds to farmers to regrow their lost crops. We are now starting a multi-year effort to rebuild the schools, the clinics, the roads, the homes. So you can't just think small anymore. For us, it's more than just protecting a conservation area now. We have to, to, to think more than our borders and see our place in the greater landscape. Because after all, all we want is also long-term coexistence and balance. And I believe that educating girls will take us there. The reason... <laughs> Thank you. The reason I'm standing here today is because of Gorongosa efforts to change gender norms and elevate Mozambican women. If you teach girls or women, if you teach women, engage women, and empower women, we will, our, I mean, our potential will be unleashed. 
we will lift up our communities and we will protect these wild places we all depend on for a healthy, safe future. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you. Next up, we have the director for Latin America for National Geographic's Pristine Seas Project, Alex Munoz. Thank you. How do you imagine a pristine sea looks like? Just all of us take a moment and let's get a picture of a pristine sea in our heads. Do you have it? Well, this is the picture of a, of a pristine sea that I have in my head. For me, it looks like a watch, the inside of a watch. You have big wheels, you have middle size, you have smaller wheels. And although they are all different, they all make sense together. And they enable this watch to give us the exact time. If you add a wheel or if you lose one, this watch will be broken. It will never tell us the exact time anymore. Let me show you a picture of this watch in the wild ocean. This is Mexico, the Revilla Gigedo Islands. A few years ago, we went on a pristine seas expedition to these islands, and we found this incredibly healthy ecosystem with all the right parts. You have the big fish, the sharks, the mantas, the smaller fish, the algae, and let alone dive in there. What an unbelievable experience was to dive with those giant mantas that thrive in that place. And now let me tell you about a luxury watch in another place in the south. Just imagine a brand of a luxury watch. <laughs> Let me tell you about Cape Horn in the south of Chile. A few years ago, we went again on an unbelievable expedition of pristine seas to the south. And in Cape Horn, we were diving in this kelp forest. And with my friend and colleague, Pelayo Salinas, we were going down this kelp forest. And suddenly, we saw that the floor was moving. It was very strange. And then we got closer and closer and deeper, and we saw these thousands and thousands of crabs and dozens of different species eating each other in this phenomenal ecosystem, a pristine and intact ecosystem. This is how the oceans should be like. But is this the image that we usually see in today's oceans? Unfortunately not. This is bottom trawling, one of the most evil inventions of humankind. This is how they are fishing hake very near Cape Horn in my country, Chile. This is a, uh, sorry, a coral reef that must be a thousand years old that was cut by one of these trawlers. And in the north of my country, the fishing vessels that were fishing anchoveta saw these dolphins feeding in this place, and they decided to throw this, their nets anyway. All these dolphins died. And very near there, only two months ago, they found this dead dolphin that was a victim of fishing with dynamite. And you know the story of the vaquita in Mexico, the most threatened marine um, mammal in the world. Some scientists anticipate that this uh, species will be extinct this year because of the bad fishing practices and ineffective conservation efforts. So the oceans are in big trouble, and we have one more chance to save them. Enrique Sala, National Geographic Explorers, Explorer, created Pristine Seas 10 years ago, and we have an amazing team from different fields and countries that most of them are here in this audience. And we have one goal in mind, protecting the last wild places in the world's oceans. And the way we do that is by creating large marine reserves that, that not only protect the rich biodiversity, but also uh, they bring the fish back, they bring jobs back, they feed people, and they make these marine ecosystems more resilient to climate change. So it's a pretty good solution if you think about it. Sometimes I get the question, what's the right approach for doing that? Is that a top-down approach? Do you just shake hands with the president and then just order the creation of a marine reserve? Or a bottom-up approach? Do you work with a local community and then wait until the rest of the society understands their proposal? 
actually we think that it's both at the same time. We work with different actors, different groups that usually are in opposite sides of the street, opposite sides of a debate, and just make them be aware of the facts, scientific facts, and make them listen to each other so they can build a common solution together. This is uh, Juan Fernandez fishing community. Juan Fernandez is an archipelago in Chile, and it's one of the most environmentally advanced communities I've ever met. In the 1930s, they already figured out the way to manage their lobster fishery, which is today one of the most sustainable fisheries in the world. And we worked with them with, uh, for many years, and they understood the facts, the science that we brought, and they proposed the creation of the two largest marine uh, reserves in Chile. And we have worked with many communities and indigenous peoples in, in different parts of Latin America to do the same. Also, we work with scientists from our team and local scientists that usually know more about the place than us. And we work together and they perform these great explorations um, to build the scientific support for these proposals. And we use technology like this amazing submarine or the drop cameras that, was, that were invented by National Geographic and that uh, enabled us to know the seafloor and the, sea, the, the deep sea like never before. And we uh, put together these amazing documentaries. And these are so important because unfortunately information doesn't move the world. Emotions move the world. And when people see our shows, they just fall in love with this place. Presidents, communities, everyone want to protect these places once they see our shows. Recently, we have incorporated a new, a new tool, satellite images. And we have Juan Mayorga here that does this amazing um, analysis to estimate the economic impacts of uh, closing an area. And we work with visionary leaders like former president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, that was brave enough to create three large marine reserves that are the largest in Latin America. So is this enough? No, we're going even further. This is something we should be very proud of. Chile and Argentina, two different countries working with National Geographic together on a joint expedition to Antarctic Peninsula. Just remember that both countries almost went to war 40 years ago because of a territorial dispute. And now they're working together for science and marine conservation and they have jointly proposed the conservation and protection of Antarctic Peninsula. That's really outstanding in terms of the relationship that we're building. So what has been the result of this? In a period of eight years, Chile went from almost zero to 24% of its waters protected, creating four marine parks fully protected, uh, covering nearly one million square kilometers of ocean. Mexico created a the largest marine reserve in North America, 150,000 square kilometers protected in the Rabia Jijeo Islands. Argentina just created two reserves, jumping from two to 9% of its water protected, adding 100,000 square kilometers of ocean protected. Ecuador created the first large marine sanctuary in the Darwin and Wolf Islands in the Galapagos Islands, which is the sharkiest place on earth. Colombia, expanded its marine park from 7,000 to 27,000 square kilometers that is fully protected. So that's what has been done in Latin America. In total, 11 big marine reserves, seven of them in the last few years. And our impact has been even global. We have done 30 expeditions. We have helped create 21 marine reserves covering over 5 million square kilometers of ocean that today are totally protected. Mm. Yeah. Of course, we didn't do this alone. Nobody can. Not National Geographic, not a country, not an NGO, not a group of scientists. We have to work all together and be very smart and strategic about this. And don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that we don't see our differences and and, and tell everybody what we think about the problems. We have a responsibility to tell the world what those problems are. We have to be faithful to the truth. But the house is on fire. And at the end of the day, we only have each other to put that fire out. We have to work together. That's why we have 
decided to throw a more ambitious project. National Geographic, together with the Waste Foundation, have launched the last wild places and the campaign for future to protect 30% of the planet. And we need to keep working together. We need each one of you in this room and everybody outside this room to be involved. Your support and your engagement really matters. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Our final speaker is an ecologist working for the American Prairie Reserve and a National Geographic Fellow. Please welcome Ray Wynn Grant. Thank you. I grew up in big cities, and it wasn't until I was 20 years old, a young adult, that I had my first experience in nature. I went on my first hike, I pitched my first tent, and I saw my first wild animal. And without a doubt, it changed my life. Because ever since then, I have dedicated my life and my career to the study of carnivore ecology, mainly African lions, and now I'm no National Geographic photographer, so these are my own pictures of lions I collared, <laughs> and black bears in North America. And when it comes to bears, some people view them as vicious, ferocious animals that have something against us. But through my work, I've come to view them as quiet, dignified ecosystem engineers that have a lot in common with people. We like to eat the same foods. Fortunately or unfortunately, we like to live in the same places. We're concerned about raising our offspring in safe, nurturing environments. And we all like to sleep a whole lot. <laughs> and when it comes to bears, like many carnivores all over the world, some of the biggest conservation challenges surround their interactions with people. And that has informed a lot of my work and focused it in many ways. So my ecology work on carnivores largely surrounds those populations at the human wildland interface, or at the spaces where people and wild animals overlap. And it's this expertise that helped to develop my fellowship with the American Prairie Reserve. APR is on a mission to create the largest protected area in the continental United States. Located in eastern central Montana, APR is working to rewild part of the American Great Plains. And at the same time, to work with cattle ranching communities to create wildlife friendly ranching practices, something virtually unheard of in many parts of the world. APR is also on a mission to diversify local economies to support people and give communities a very bright future. And most importantly to me, we're working together to solve human wildlife conflict problems and even prevent them before they start. Now, a fully restored <coughs> ecosystem in the American Great Plains requires the conservation of grizzly bears and other threatened species in the ecosystem. These bears in particular are my focus area right now, and as part of a conservation success story in the United States, they have been growing in population size and migrating out of protected areas like Yellowstone and Glacier National Park faster than many of us thought was possible. They are quite literally walking over to their historic habitat in the prairie. And as a conservationist, this makes me very excited. However, there are a lot of people who aren't as excited. And the American Prairie Reserve 
and me and my colleagues, along with state wildlife agencies, small and large NGOs, local stakeholders, and entire communities are coming together and working together to answer a lot of questions that are arising and to create really effective action plans to make sure that we are protecting wildlife where there are people and protecting people where there are wildlife. And so these three protected areas that, will, that are or will be strongholds for grizzly bears and other wildlife are very, very important. And one of the most important things is that there's some type of connectivity between the three. Dispersal isn't effective unless, I'm sorry, conservation isn't effective unless there's some type of sustained safe dispersal. I am particularly interested in corridors that might be found between these three areas. Those three strongholds create essentially a triangle. And we believe that with safe corridors for wildlife, as well as stepping stones of high quality wildlife habitat, we can maintain effective dispersal of individual bears as well as genetic material between these three protected areas. This will lead to conservation success and ultimately the persistence of populations of grizzly bears and many threatened wildlife species in Montana. And so I did some work to fuse technical science with field work, with basic bear biology. And I collected a lot of information about the landscape, everything from tree and forest cover to waterways, and things about the human landscape, like the distribution of roads and highways, human population density, cities and towns. Coupling those things that represent the landscape with basic science about bears and carnivores, their pure biology. And I used this information in a statistical framework that uses circuit theory from electrical engineering to make predictions about how the landscape looks to an animal. What are the most resistant parts of the landscape to move through? And what are the most accessible or least resistant parts of the landscape that an animal might move through? And the most important thing about conservation statistics, of course, is data visualization. Nobody wants to look at a lot of numbers. And so I used um, ESRI mapping software to make these results into maps that we can look at. And the maps show the easiest spaces that bears might use to leave Yellowstone and Glacier and recolonize their historic habitat on the American prairie. That's what you see in this image, the outline of the state of Montana and these beautiful white lines that, if you focus on the center of the image, create that triangle once again. It's proof of concept. We knew it from our local understanding of the landscape, and now we knew it through a very rigorous statistical design. It's there. These pathways are possible. And using this type of statistical framework and all these different knowledge sources allow us to even ask further questions. What if we overlaid some of those pathways with human land use variables? Let's try one that's really important to bears, like agriculture and ranching. If we put the locations of agriculture and ranching landscapes onto this image, it might look something like this. And all of a sudden, that beautiful triangle of potential pathways for bears to disperse between protected areas is slightly obscured. And this isn't new information. Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and many of the stakeholders and collaborators we work with have been addressing what to do in these spaces. But in particular, myself and my colleagues at APR are interested in those red and green dots that you see around the American Prairie Reserve. Grizzly bears are on their way to our space, but they're not there yet. And it gives us a tremendous opportunity to go into the communities that we think will be most affected by wildlife and prevent conflict before it starts. We're bringing our ideas with us, and we're sitting and we're listening to what people have to say about the land that they have owned for generations. And so the next step of my work is to iterate the statistical modeling approach and involve the community even more than before 
to get to the real stuff. Attitudes, tolerance levels, belief systems, and include that in an actual statistical framework to make further predictions and to do a better job at addressing people's needs and wildlife needs on this landscape. And so no matter if I am being hands-on with animals or if I am analyzing their landscape from a distance, I am very concerned with making sure that science is addressing the needs of people because the community is the future of wildlife conservation. And what I've learned through my fellowship thus far with National Geographic and the American Prairie Reserve is that there is this beautiful balance between technical, rigorous science and heart and soul and a compassionate listening ear. Thank you. Thank you. So my first question to you is, what is it like to hold a baby bear? I love getting this question, Laurel. <laughs> um, and baby bears always steal the show. So I usually like to have the attention and then pull out a bear cub and no one's looking at me anymore. Um, but a lot of folks don't know that bears and dogs have a common ancestor. And so little baby bears are a whole lot like little puppies. And so when you pull them out of their den for scientific work only, of course, um, they're really cold. And so they want to snuggle. And you just have to put them in your jacket. And they like to lick your neck a little bit. And it really it couldn't be cuter. I could talk about baby bears for a long time. But I'm going to invite the rest of our speakers back on stage. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for your very insightful talks. So all of the stories you shared were pretty positive. It was about working with people. The people are happy. The animal's happy. We're all happy. But I'm sure it's not actually that simple, right? Can you talk about some of the challenges you've had in your work? Would you like to start, Dominique? Because um, challenges. I think we can talk about it a lot all afternoon. Um, if I say challenge for me as a young woman working uh, in the communities in Gorongosa, the first thing is I'll say my size apparently counts a lot because people, um, especially in the communities, first question is how old are you? But uh, then when we pass that, of course, there's a, there's a lot of healing still to be done for the people, especially in Africa, I would say, to the people who live near protected areas. There's a lot of work so people start to understand more about the value of having it instead of not looking at it as a, as a cost. So for me, being in the field, for example, talking to communities, is always about how I present myself and how I respect the traditions. And I do, and the, the most fascinating things is seeing other girls and women and general people in the community just looking at me fascinated because I'm wearing pants. Um, <laughs> yes, but then after that is also, they also look even more surprised when they see that I know the traditions and I follow it. And it's very genuine because it's, they're also my traditions. So, thank you. What about you guys? Well, in, in our case, um, the, the greed of the commercial fleet is really uh, immense, and we have to um, deal with that every day. Um, um, the fishing industry um, today fishes in 95% of the world's oceans, and every time that we want to protect a place, <clears throat> they, are, they are with their lobby, and they get to the governments, and they make phone calls, uh, so, we, so they try to stop us uh, every single time. And uh, if, they, if it was for them, they would fish everything out. I mean, they just don't care about sustainable fishing. Um, so there's a big pressure, like political pressure and power, to stop us from achieving our goal. So um, imagine how it's going to be in the next years when we want to protect 30%. We are very aware of that. Uh, and that's why we will have to be more effective and smarter than ever if we want to win. 
Yeah, and I could talk about challenges. Of course, all of us as conservation scientists can. Um, but one main one is, you know, we're in the business of restoration. And uh, the landscape where I'm working with the American Prairie Reserve, um, the wildlife were extirpated from that landscape deliberately, right? It wasn't an accident that we have local extinctions and that we're trying to rebuild a wildlife community. And so along with this goal of rewilding comes a lot of misunderstanding and um, a lot of uh, kind of cultural differences. So for many people on the landscape, um, cattle ranching or agricultural production means something very deep in an identity way. And I may see, as a scientist lives in the East Coast, has a lot of education and can do the modeling and create some proof, I might see a lot of potential in a landscape. But what's most important is understanding where people's hearts are. And that's a challenge for both of us on both sides, um, for us to all realize that we have the same goals. We want to see people thrive, and we want to see wildlife thrive without any feelings of disrespect or malintent. So I found that, you know, I find math and science and statistics really challenging. Um, but even more than that, it's just getting to the heart of things with people and building trust. So speaking of where people's hearts are, Dominique, you talked about how you're almost incentivizing people to support the park by offering benefits like health care and education. And Alex, you talked about how hard it is to get people to care. So my question is, is there a difference between incentivizing people to support something and to getting and to getting them to care? And does the difference matter when if it maybe it leads to the same result or maybe it doesn't? Well, let's say in and around going goes that people do care. You know, this is the place is not just uh, something that someone brought and put in there. It's, it's always been there. There's deep connection between the people and the environment, the forest, the wildlife. As I always say, it's part of our, you know, uh, our beliefs, our totem. But as I said again, it's this need for healing. So not only incentives, but benefits, actually, is provide decent benefits that you know, helps not only for people to, I wouldn't say care because they do care, to support, but really creates a virtuous cycle. Because if we talk about a benefit as education, it's not something that you receive today and it's over in a month or so. It's something that builds up and we will only see the return of that in maybe five, 10 years. So that's where I stand. It's not just incentives, it's really uh, real opportunities in life that that will create a virtuous cycle for us. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> well, in my, in my experience, uh, it's very important that people feel some ownership of, um, of the marine reserves that we propose. Um, uh, I really don't think that um, there's, there can be like an external force or maybe a, just a top-down approach where pe people just order things and then the rest follows. Um, in our case, and I think this is going to be even uh, stronger in the future, we have to make people participate, very actively participate, and you have to listen to them and you have to incorporate many of their visions so the final solution represents a whole. Of course, we cannot um, satisfy everybody because some people may say, you know, everything should be open to fishing and that's not what we want. We have to explain very clearly the facts and the science and what are the impacts of, of each option. Uh, and then be persuasive so everybody's on board of one single solution. And we believe that um, marine reserves, when they are fully protected and they are well located, they can satisfy things in a way that everybody wins. Like fishermen, for example, they, when they are opposed to these reserves, sometimes they, or most of the time, they realize that if they protect one place, then they will be able to fish more outside the reserve, and, um, and so on. So everybody has to understand what's their share and how they can win, and then they feel actively involved and be actually proud of the reserve that is finally created. 
What do you think, Ray? Yeah, well, I have a great story to tell, and I'm so excited to tell it. Um, and it's about my first trip uh, to Montana, to the American Prairie Reserve for the beginning of my fellowship. And there's a big dinner that was created up on the reserve, um, which is really hard to access. And it was for ranchers. So it was a big dinner um, just for cattle ranchers on the American Prairie Reserve. And one of them stood up and said, it is against every value and principle that I have to be here and to be a fan of APR, but I am. And the reason was that this individual and their family had tried out some of the American Prairie Reserve's wildlife friendly ranching techniques. And APR has created a whole program called Wild Sky Ranching, and it incentivizes ranchers to adopt some environmentally friendly procedures and in turn get some extra funding on their ranch and the trade-off is that they're doing something great for the environment, in particular for large mammals. So for black bears, for mountain lions, for some of the larger bodied mammals that are there already. And this person is making more money than they were before and also facilitating uh, the restoration of the prairie. And they didn't want to like it, you know? And so it's exactly what you said, where an incentive for an individual actually was able to change their action and their dedication um, to a cause. And it's a wonderful model that APR has developed that I'm trying to just shout from the rooftops. And we're hoping that it can serve as a model for other um, organizations within the Last Wild Places Initiative. Earlier, Dominique, you talked about how when you go into these communities, they're surprised by the fact that you know the culture because it's your culture too. And on the other hand, you've also talked about how you've, you work with people that you might completely disagree with or you might not understand or might not understand you. So what's it, is it important to have locals working in conservation? And if you're not a local, how do you bridge those differences? Dominique, do you want to start? Of course, it's important <laughs> to have locals. Um, as I said, I'm here and I'm from there. I know the tradition. I didn't just learn to be able to do the work, but I grew up following those traditions, which make it very genuine. But it is important also that others, and they come, they follow it because people need to feel respected. People want to feel heard. And when that happens, they open many, many doors. Uh, one of the things that happened was, as I also work with human and uh, wildlife coexistence, I like to be optimistic. Um, when I, I, the first times I went there was just a lot of, you know, a lot of trauma, a lot of just hunger. But I started to just listen, listen more and follow the traditions more. For example, instead of just wearing go there wearing my pants, I would put my traditional clothes. And they start to see that actually she meant it, you know, she she knows what she's doing. She's part of us. So it became the the last thing, it became that it's not anymore your elephants, our farms. It's our elephants in our landscape. So this is the big change that it takes time. So Wherever, if you're from there or not, take time and invest in listening and learning and really just paying that tribute to the local people because they are being, they're going to be the ones who are going to really yeah. doing the thing on the ground. Yeah, and as you can imagine, I'm the opposite of Dominique in a lot of ways where I am quite non-traditional in the landscape where I work um, in terms of identity. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it's um, something that I'm constantly learning is how to be effective with my identity and my presence in the space. I know everything about bears. I know everything about them. Um, I don't know everything about Montana. And that's really important. I can't pretend that I do. And so coming with humility um, and with sincerity and authenticity is important. And one cool thing is intersectionality, just as an individual. You know, I am who I am, but there are things that I have in common with some of the folks that I'll be working with or some of the people that I hope to, you know, come into cooperation with. Whether it's, you know, we're both interested in a certain type of outdoor activity. 
um, I'm a mother, and there are lots of mothers in Montana. And so that has been a really great entryway into just getting people to build trust and to just find some common ground in order to start those hard conversations. Alex, what have your experiences been? No, working with the local communities and especially indigenous people is fundamental. It's all about a very sincere connection with them. Uh, you have to work with them in a very authentic way. This is not about just bringing a manual and try to uh, apply a formula. This has to be tailor-made, and you have to build that trust. And that means being with them in the good and the bad times. Uh, in Juan Fernandez, for example, uh, Juan Fernandez Islands in Chile, I worked with them for 10 years. And the, the change in the relationship I had with them had nothing to do with the marine conservation. They were hit by a tsunami and they lost half of the town and they, a lot of people were, died in that tragic event. And I decided to stop my work, my campaign, uh, and raise some funds with the organization I used to work for, uh, Oceana, and uh, we launched a big effort to hire all the local divers to get all the marine debris from the water so we can start rebuilding that place. Then they said, okay, now we can work together. Finally, after eight years, we created the Juan Fernandez Marine Reserve and the Desventuras Reserve that add 600,000 square kilometers of ocean protected. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I want to thank you so much for everything you've shared. And can we please give them one last round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Dominic, Ray, Alex. Do you all realize that every half an hour, we are taking you on a journey across the planet from Gorongosa to Montana? Well, a moment ago after I introduced the VR uh, session, I realized that I forgot uh, to mention two very important people. The folks right here at National Geographic, Jenna Pirog and Kate Mullen, who actually took all of that rubbish footage I had shot and actually made that program for you. So thank you to them if they're watching it on live stream. Now, with VR, it might be limited to these goggles here, the, uh, these headsets. But National Geographic Channel, that all of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with, reaches 173 countries, 172 countries, and is transmitted in 43 languages worldwide. The next group of speakers are responsible for the content on this channel. I'm thrilled to introduce Chris Albert, Executive Vice President, Global Communications and Talent Re Relations for National Geographic Partners. Let's welcome Chris and his panelists. Welcome. All right, how's everybody doing this afternoon? I am super excited about this panel. You know, to put it simply, it is about storytelling and how we at Partners specifically bring the natural world to life for our audiences all over the world with some of the best filmmakers and storytellers in the world, like the ones sitting next to me. I'm thrilled to introduce, introduce Vanessa Berlowitz, Martha Holmes, and Chris Riley. I'm not gonna read their bios because there's nothing worse than a moderator reading bios, but I am gonna ask you guys each a question, and if you can give us a little bit of your background uh, as you answer my first question, that would be great. And one of my favorite questions to ask everyone who is here this week is about their passion, their passion for what they do. So I would love to understand and have you explain to us where your passion for storytelling comes from. You wanna start, Vanessa? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a great honor to be in these fantastic buildings and meet you all. Um, my passion for storytelling probably started as a kid um, with my mother, who I think probably if she'd had her time again would have been a film director. But she weaned me on to American cinema really early. So whilst my friends were watching Thomas the Tank Engine, I was being shown things like Papillon, Midnight Cowboy, Raging Bull, <laughs> Taxi Driver, um, The Godfather as I got a bit older, and then Blade Runner. And, How and old actually, were you when you were watching Raging Bull? <laughs> <laughs> too young, too young. So she was getting bootleg coffees. I don't know how she had friends in the industry, but so I, I 
that's how I got my passion. It's like these were great character studies and amazing storytellers. And tell us a little bit about what you're, where you're working now, what you do sure. now. Sure. So um, I'm very lucky. I've started a, a company with my husband and a production company in Bristol, which is the mecca of wildlife filmmaking. Uh, well, it has been for, for, for many of us. And um, we are currently producing two series for uh, National Geographic. Very honored to do so, America and Queens, and a couple of uh, feature-length documentaries on wildlife for Disney. Um, prior to that, I had many long years working at the BBC and worked on series like Planet Earth, Frozen Planet, Planet Earth 2, and many other um, hours, single hours of, of television. We're very excited about the shows you're working on for us, so we'll get to those in a second. But Martha, I'd love to hear about your passion for storytelling. Uh, I had a very different experience <laughs> to Vanessa. So I was animals first and foremost in the outside world. So I brought up on the shores of uh, Middle East and Africa. So the sea was my playground. And I loved escaping the stories, as we all do, I'm sure, dramas and so forth. And I never really thought about the two marrying together. So I chased my ambition to work outside with animals. And I tried being an academic. I'm sure a lot of you are academics. And it just didn't work for me because I wasn't clever enough. And um, I just didn't feel that my, any artistic side in me was coming out. And I hated the data crunching. And I just wanted to be outside more. So then I looked into television. And then I, all I thought, I just, I'll just have a nice time being outside with animals. Thank you very much. I wasn't very imaginative. And then as your life um, builds, I'm sure you have had this experience, you get layers and layers of interest as you mature and grow and find new things. And I just, so I, I went into the business just wanting to be outside filming. And then the storytelling almost eclipsed that. So now my, I, my absolute love is being in the cutting room, crafting the stories when people come back from the field with the footage. So I would say it's a, it's a latter thing. I grew up on films and loved it, but I never thought my love of wildlife would marry that. And luckily, they have. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm really blessed to be in the cutting room, crafting stories and trying to give the audience the best story we can possibly give them. And can you tell us a little bit about where you are today? Yeah. So I am head of natural history at a company called Plimsoll Productions. Um, it's not an entirely wildlife uh, company. We do all sorts of, we call it fact and you call it reality shows, I think, and science docs and all that sort of stuff. So we have a broad range, but a large chunk of it is natural history. And like Vanessa, I had a history 25 years in the BBC for my sins. Um, <laughs> But it's a very, very, very good learning school. And you can, you, you know, you, you start at the very bottom and you learn everything and then you can decide what, if you want to specialize, what you specialize in. So I was very lucky to have that as my hinterland. Chris? Well, I was um, about two years old when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon almost uh, 50 years ago, coming up this summer. Um, and by the time I was five, people were routinely living and working on the moon, driving electric cars deep into the mountains there. Um, three people even went there twice. It seemed like a really kind of regular thing, um, an extension of, you know, our human exploration. And by the time I was about eight, there were robotic probes landing on Mars and Venus and sending back pictures. I had them all over my bedroom wall. And I guess it's hard to think of a bigger, more exciting story that captures you as, as a child at that age. Um, and then Star Wars came out in 1977. I was 10. And what George Lucas had managed to do in terms of visualizing exoplanets almost 20 years before they were actually discovered um, blew me away. I mean, I still get sort of shivers down my spine when I remember sitting in a dark room like this and those curtains would move slightly wider on this screen. And then on would come the kind of edge of this exoplanet there. Um, and so it was really um, a passion for planetary science that I was sort of injected into there through that storytelling, I guess. And then there was a really seminal edition of National Geographic magazine. I've never told anyone this story, actually, and it's perhaps the best place to perhaps tell people for the first time. The January 1985 edition, and it's, it's on the board just outside those doors there. It's got Coco the gorilla on the front cover. It had the most fantastic article on... Um, the planetary geologists that were exploring the solar system, the moons of Jupiter, and a little bit about what we knew about the moons of Saturn at that time. So all over this article. And that was a seminal year for me, because I was deciding what to go and study at university. And I went straight into, into applied geology and planetary science after that article came out. And I kept it. I read it dozens and dozens of times over the next few years. It was really life-changing for me. 
And I went into science after that, um, thinking I was sort of brainy enough to perhaps do that. And what a mistake that was, because actually, you've got to be so gifted to, to make a career in science. And what I realized I'd mistaken, actually, was a love of storytelling for a love of science. And I have a love of both. But what I really found I wanted to do was tell other people's stories. Um, like, um, like you, Martha, I got into the BBC soon after that, and um, I spent 10 years there. And it is a wonderful, wonderful apprenticeship there to learn how to tell stories, and I'm still doing it today. And do you want to give us your quick where you are right now? Well, yes, I've sort of got stuck in lunar orbit a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so I've just finished a children's book on, on all of the Apollo missions, which comes out uh, next month, called Where Once We Stood. Um, and I've written a big live show that's going to happen on the Mall here in Washington on the 19th and the 20th of July outside the Air and Space Museum and up and down the Mall. We're just cutting the film at the moment as, as I speak. And um, if any of you can get a chance to come and see that, I really urge you to. It will be, in every sense of the word, awesome. <laughs> and I don't always use that word. <laughs> so we were talking earlier, you know, the natural history world or the natural world is not the same as it was 50 years ago, 10 years ago, even last year. And obviously, as this group well knows, you know, climate change is playing a huge role. So I'm curious how specifically our changing world and climate change has affected your filmmaking and storytelling when it comes to telling stories about our natural world. Martha, you want to start? Yeah, I think, I think somebody's invitational interest might be somebody else's turn off. Um, I think so it's horses for courses. You know, some programs you want to address it fully. Some programs you want to accept it but not lay any blame. Some programs, if you want another audience, just don't mention it at all. So I think it, it's very, you know, um, in Hostile Planet, which we made recently for Nat Geo, we, it was stated very much as a fact, but we weren't pointing any fingers that the, the cause of, of climate change was never addressed. It was just, this is what the animals are facing now. So I just think it's horses for courses. I think it's who your audience is, who you're appealing to. You've got to bring people in. You don't want to turn them off. If they're interested, engage it with it. And if they're not, then do a different kind of programming. Chris? Well, this is something we really grappled with when we were uh, thrashing out, you know, what kind of beast One Strange Rock would be. Um, and, I, and I think there's, there's been a massive disconnect somehow between the storytellers and at least half the audience, those that still uh, perhaps come to these shows, that they appreciate the kind of riches of the natural world, but then they go and vote at the ballot box for the opposite. And our job is trying to bridge that gap, a chasm, if you like, actually, as it is these days. How do you do that? Is, is it something, is it a flaw in, in, in the stories and how we're constructing them? When we first started asking ourselves these questions for, for, for One Strange Rock, what we came up with together was an attempt to try and connect the lives and ecosystems of, of the animals that are featured in the series with the lives of those watching. In a way, a little bit like um, Pete Muller was talking about this morning, a sense of what home is and how these creatures' lives feed into our own lives absolutely and utterly directly. There's no disconnect with that. And that was why we ended up with this approach of using astronauts to connect us to it, to try and examine the world with this overview uh, perspective. But an overview perspective is a very difficult and an intangible thing to try and communicate. Most of us haven't flown above 60 miles or 100 kilometers above the atmosphere, and we don't really know what that feels like, however many times we're told. So our approach was to kind of connect these small, personal, often human stories. Our, our natural history sequences were often led by a human being um, with the next breath that you take, for example, in Gasp, um, connecting you to the diatoms, our heroes of that episode or the nitrogen cycle um, in the, uh, the salmon bringing the Pacific nitrogen to feed the forests around the Pacific Rim, um, which maintains the entire nitrogen cycle that keeps, keeps us alive, another of our crucial life support systems. That was our approach. Now, have we achieved anything that others haven't with that? I, I don't know that's for the audience to decide. There were certainly lots of people that came and watched it and said they liked it, and people that hadn't come to this kind of subject matter before. Will that translate actually to the sorts of wonderful projects that we've been hearing about this week here? I sincerely hope so, but um, we're still waiting to find out, I think. Vanessa? 
I think I, mean, I agree with everything you've both said. Um, my feeling is that we need to use our best storytelling skills and our best advocates for the natural world, which is our animal characters. And I think what we're trying to do on the America series that we're um, working with uh, for National Geographic um, is to use those heroes, those animal heroes, to convey the experience that they're going through today. So instead of looking at how their experiences would have been, it's to say this is the real world for animals today. And particularly in America, the animals that succeed here are incredible at um, reacting to opportunity. And that comes from living in a uniquely dynamic continent where change is an everyday process. Every day is a brave new world. So it's, it's actually a, a great way to build the changing environment into the storytelling and see it through the eyes of the animal characters. And I feel that that you know, we just have to get cleverer and better at bringing the reality of our changing environment into our storytelling. So let's dive into some of the shows specifically that you all worked on for us. And I think I'm going to start with Hostile Planet. I think one of the things people don't realize is when we set out to do one of these shows, how long it takes. Hostile Planet, you shot over 1,800 hours of footage. 82 shoots, 1,300 days of filming. <laughs> You're tired just thinking about it. Um, I think some of you maybe have seen this trailer, but let's take a quick look at what was accomplished during those 1,300 days. I love that trailer. I think I have seen it maybe a hundred times. Our creative team did such a good job on that. And I think it touches on what I think sets this series apart, which is sort of the tone of the series. Could you talk a little bit about the tone of the series and the creative choices you made? Sure. So um, Nat Geo hadn't done a big blue chip natural history show for a while. and. Um, the BBC had been doing them and doing them very beautifully and it's all very lovely and we'll on we go. <laughs> and Nat Geo wanted to set themselves apart and say we want to do this differently. And the brief was to make it different, raw, hostile, that's the term we came up with, um, visceral, granular truth. And rather than, not sugar-coated because that's a bit unfair and, and judgmental, but or pejorative, but um, anyway, so that was that's what we set out to do. So, so I know in the series you didn't shy away from difficult moments. I've watched it with numerous audiences, and there were moments where what you mean. <laughs> where they would shriek um, <laughs> at watching. But you didn't you you didn't hesitate to keep the camera just locked on what was happening and sort of what was the decision behind that? Well, there's a lot of debate about it. Obviously, I mean, we wanted to tell the truth not only about climate change. Again, I said earlier we didn't we didn't point any fingers, but this is the situation. And the critical thing for the animals is the world is changing and it's changing very fast. Animals do evolve, but they can't evolve quick enough to keep up with the climate change. So it's how are they doing is the sort of it. It was a mark in the sand saying, how are these animals doing? And things are tougher and for them. And so the animals, some 
survive and thrive and doing incredibly well, and others have a tougher time of it. We chose n not to pull back from the reality of how hard they're finding it and how hard they find it in a, rev in a normal year when things are lovely and wonderful and they're used to it all. But things aren't lovely and wonderful and used to it all. It is changing very fast. So we just wanted to be honest. Um, Technologically wise um, and storytelling wise, we very much wanted to be, Vanessa kind of touched on it, on the side of the animals. We wanted to be on the animal's shoulders. It's very easy in natural history and historically we used to do it where an animal would be over there and you'd have a long lens and you'd sit back and you'd watch the behavior unfold. I think audiences expect more now and we, needed the, we really wanted the audience to engage and feel that they were with the animal. So where we could, we'd have be with the animal. Um, rather than just watching it as if you were watching it through binoculars or something. And that's partly in the camera techniques we use, and it's partly in the words we use. So, we, some, you know, a word not saying elephants do this, but it's almost like it's... it's so let me just think of an example. Um, uh, a lion might be thinking it's a hot day. <laughs> and rather than say, well, the temperature outside is whatever it is, 40 degrees centigrade, and the lions are feeling hot, you say, it's hot. Um, you know, shade is, is really welcome. That could be in the lion's head. It's very subtle, but you're saying the same thing and you're trying to be, experience it through the animal. So we were doing, obviously, we we're working very hard on the script to make you feel you're embedded with the animals, all the camera shots to make you feel that, you know, traditionally you have a POV, but we tried to really embed the POV point of view shots with the, with the watching the animal shots. So it was, it was a lot of, lot of work went into that. And then technology-wise, so, you know, for example, we used a racing drone very effectively um, particularly in two shows, one um, being a golden eagle flying over mountains, and you know how our birds of prey stoop. So we had this racing drone literally fly unbelievably fast down these these arets, these razor edged um, edges of mountains and things. You really felt you were you were with the golden eagle. And again, in the jungles program, we had this tiny little hummingbird being battered by drops of rain that kind of went, whoa, and off, off, off balance. And then we had the racing drone. I have to tell you this very funny story. But then it's a racing drone and flying through the forest um, as if it was a hummingbird. And, he, and at one point, we were trying to endlessly wipe the lens of that racing drone. And then you saw, actually, no, the hummingbird is flying through this water. It wouldn't be perfect. So then we let bits of water stay on the lens, and suddenly it's a bit blurred. And the, you know what I mean? As if, and you do feel it's more visceral. But the, I just have to show you no, no, please, very, no, very no, funny no. story. <laughs> so the guy who runs this, does this racing drone thing, he was doing it through, but not, you know, he can't see where his drone is going through the, the drone is going through the plants. So he's doing it all from camera on his headset. So he's, he's f literally flying with his eyes and he has a little control mechanism. He's amazingly good at it. But this little control panel has a little red light. And one of the hummingbirds, a hummingbird in the forest, thought, oh, that's a nice bright light. That will be a flower. I'll go and get some nectar. So this guy's blind to what's going on. And he's flying through the thing. And he's twiddling and twiddling. And this thing lands. He goes, ah, like this. <laughs> and of course, that, that, the drone then goes, whoa. And so his drone went flying off into trees. He had no idea where it went because he threw the control panel away. Because <laughs> <laughs> this tiny little hummingbird landed on his finger. <laughs> there, must be, anyway, there must be so few people in the world who actually have the skill to fly a drone like that. Yeah, very few. I mean, you really have to seek these people. And, and if you want to break into a new technology, you really have to get into the scientific world and find these people who are developing think, these things, often for their scientific research, nothing to do with filmmaking. And then you try and adapt it for, for filmmaking. So one more quick question about Hostile Planet, and then we'll talk about something else. Is it, you know There was a little streaming service that dropped a natural history program at the same time as we launched Hostile Planet. It was beautiful, but it was very traditional. It had David Attenborough. You guys went with, yeah. <laughs> you, you went with Bear Grylls, which I thought was an interesting choice as far as his narration and his voice. And can you talk a little bit about that decision and how we, how we came to that idea? Yeah, Bear, Bear Grylls, um, like him or not like him, is a survivalist par excellence. And these animals are surviving, and they are resilient, and they're everything that Bear stands for. He stands for everything that they do day in, day out. And actually, 
he was kind of outside the natural history world and, and a bit of a surprise, but I think really, really fitted the show in terms of what these animals were trying to achieve. Getting Bear to narrate a natural history show <laughs> from a survival show was a really long journey. Um, and again, a fascinating one. So he kind of stood up for the first sentence and we just warmed him up a little bit and he said, and ah, these bears, oh, yeah. and we said, hang on a minute. <laughs> we just, a little more gently and, and it took a long time. But anyway, we, I just said, my initial thing was bear, just pretend you're reading to your children at night and you want them to go to sleep. I'm trying to get in from over here to over here. And, just soften the tone, deepen your voice, just relax, be really warm, and invite the audience in, invite your children into the story. So he kind of went there, and I'm still expecting him to get over here from over there. Anyway, we got there, and to do him credit, he worked really hard at it, and by the last few um, commentary records which, I, which Kevin was at, he pretty much nailed it. I mean, we had to do retakes and retakes and retakes and retakes, but we weren't over here anymore at all. He, did, he worked so hard um, to get it as far over here as he could. So he was great, yeah, good to work with. So live, is obviously another, live television is obviously another storytelling approach that we take, and Plimsoll is actually working on a show that we're airing in two weeks called Yellowstone Live. Last August, we went live from Yellowstone for four nights, and we're doing it again starting June 23rd. So we'll take a quick look at a tape, and then I'm going to ask you a couple questions about that. This is real. Imagine. This is live. And that's the magic of Yellowstone. It's four nights, 25 live cameras, a large number of remote cameras. How do you even begin to prepare for such a massive production? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the live specialist. Um, I, my role really on this is kind of guarding the, the wildlife in terms of the message and, and making sure that we get that right. Um, how do you do it? Well, it literally is baby steps. You have. I'm just basically going to walk you through this. You have a sheet of paper with five acts on it, and there are little bricks. And in those, it's one brick at a time. We want to start live, and we want to cut to amazing wildlife, and we want to see some scenery. And we and we keep on thinking we have to think about the glory of Yellowstone, and we want some live. And we, you know what I mean? And there's there's various elements that you're piecing in, and you return to, and you literally fill out that wall of bricks with. We need to come back to that here and that there, and we'll round up the wildlife here and and you f literally fill it in like that. And we know the animal characters, the bears, the wolves, the eagles, and you need a taste of all of them, and you want a live animal in a studio. And it's, just, it's painting by numbers, because that sounds too simplistic, but it's building a wall brick, brick by brick when you know what those, each of those bricks is. But then when there's a bear coming over the ridge in Act 2 and you didn't know, have plan for that, you kind of throw that out the window a little bit to some extent too, you don't you? Be, yeah, you have to be very nimble. And the chaos, the chaos that goes on in a live truck, I don't know if you've ever been witness to a live truck, but it's this massive truck <laughs> with a studio inside and everybody's talking at once. I mean, literally probably 30 people in there all talking at once to their microphones or to each other or something. And it's comp and I, how anybody makes a program out of it. But again, that's not my role, so I'm fine about that. <laughs> but I think it's interesting, you know, because obviously... NFL, football live, 
but it's like a football field. You're talking Yellowstone, which is like thousands okay. of miles. So that's the other side of it. This is all pre-production I was talking about. The, the real thing is the, the knowledge, the technical knowledge of bouncing, hiring, you know, I'll hire a satellite for two hours here and three hours there, and we have teams all over, and between this hour and that hour, we've hired satellite time, as you do, and you bounce all their signal. They've been filming all day, and you get all their material up and back down to the truck, and then suddenly the editors, the moment it all starts coming in, they're quickly packaging and uh, this is what we filmed earlier and they're making these little short things. So that's all happening in the build up to the live show and then those cameras are also live in the live show. So we've had what we filmed earlier packages and you have the live cameras going satellite and down but I'm not technically logically minded so don't challenge me on this. <laughs> I, just, I just know it kind of goes up and down and out. <laughs> <laughs> I run, I run PR, that's about my knowledge too. <laughs> but sounds right. Um, let's shift for a minute to a more science-focused series, which is our series One Strange Rock, which we're incredibly proud of. Eight astronauts, six continents, 45 countries, and something I had never seen in a science natural history series, a large portion of it from the International Space Station. Um, let's take a little look at One Strange Rock, and then Chris, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions. I am going to tell you about the most incredible place. And you know what? You're walking on it. Our planet is literally bursting with life. life, life. There's so much activity, and our planet is right in the middle of it. I really wish that everyone could see the world the way that I've had a chance to see it. The strangest place in the whole universe might just be right here. So as the trailer shows, Darren Aronofsky was involved in the show. And for those that may not know who he is, he's the director of Black Swan and Mother. I mean, those are some trippy ass movies. <laughs> <laughs> what was the sensibility and what did he bring to this series? Because he'd never done a television series before like this. No, no, you're right, he hadn't. I mean, I think what, what was clever about Jane Root, our CEO at Newtopia's idea, was in, in approaching him to help us with the storytelling, was it plays back to what I was saying earlier about this challenge we had of weaving stories together in a way that just made you sit up and look and think, wow, I've not seen anything like this before just in an attempt to reach out to an audience that perhaps hadn't, en perhaps hadn't engaged with it before. Um, so I think bringing him on board, and that happened before I was involved, was, was, was really smart because he and his writing and co-producing partner, Ari Handel, who's got a PhD in neuroscience and great science background as well, um, proved to be really instrumental in helping all the producer directors shape their stories. Um, and they've They've really wallowed themselves in some of these big ideas and these deep philosophical feelings about the cycles of life and death that keep and maintain the planet's sort of fragile biosphere. Um, and they were all themes that we wanted to include, but not obviously overtly kind of bash viewers over the head with. So we needed some way of engaging on a very human level these subjects and connecting people to them that way and letting them make their own connections and their own minds up, I suppose. Um, but by showing them, as I said before, I think, about how these deep connections between these small moments um, in, in, a, in a few hours on, on Earth transfer and translate into their own lives utterly directly. 
So, yeah, he was a useful partner. And right from the start, um, they were involved, the two of them, particularly Ari, in, in the script meetings with us and helping us weave our beat sheets together and re re rewriting them. I think I wrote 36 versions of my script before we went out shooting. That was uh, quite a lesson. I mean, it was like being at film school for a year. <laughs> um, a lot of people would pay a lot of money for that. <laughs> well, yes. Yes, the master classes were great. I learned a lot making this series, and it was one wonderful two years. You talked about this earlier, um, but maybe we just touch on it quickly, which is the, uh, using the astronauts as our storytellers, which was sort of a unique way in. Nicole Stott, uh, if you all were here yesterday, she was actually on our opening panel, who was a big part of the series. Talk about the astronauts as storytellers. Yeah, so I think actually, Vanessa, you were involved early on, before, again, before I joined, with the initial discussions with Darren about how to frame the series. I mean, you might want to say something a bit about the astronauts initially. Yes, it was, uh, I was invited out by Jane to uh, spend a week with Darren and his team, uh, which was an amazing experience. As you say, lots of film students would pay, <laughs> give their hind teeth for that. Yeah. And um, at that stage, they'd done huge amounts of research on the science, and it was incredible body of work to take that much. You know, they're very complicated ideas and distill them down. But um, Jane had said to me, I don't know what you're going to bring to this, but you might have an idea or something, um, just see what happens. And I was absolutely terrified, you know, partly in awe of Darren Aronofsky and not quite sure what I was doing in the room. Um, and I sort of stayed up all night thinking there's something wrong. It needs a kind of framing for this series. It needs a point of view. And that's when I was looking at actually through my love of David Bowie, who I've often <laughs> returned to, and Chris Hadfield um, and Spiders, you know, because he sang in space. Um, I suddenly thought it has to be through the astronaut's point of view for the overview effect. And um, everybody loved it, I think, as an idea. That you immediately got it, I think, as a, as a, as a sort of format. But it's, it's one thing to have that idea and quite another thing to translate it into kind of eight really compelling astronaut personal stories that interweave with those of the planetary science. And that was a real challenge. Um, and I, I made a film with the Apollo astronauts a few years ago in the shadow of the moon and was well aware that with the right preparation and casting, you, you can find and tease out the most wonderful um, personal stories from these characters. So we spent some months casting to, to find the eight perfect hosts um, that we ended up with. And I think Eloisa Noble, producer Eloisa and I, looked at a hundred initially, a hundred astronauts we screen tested. And we distilled it slowly over the course of several months down to those eight of which Chris Hadfield was was very very much at the top of our list from from, from very early on given his communication skills. And then we worked very closely with them over those coming months to absolutely deep, deeply weave their stories in with our stories. And they had to be believable. As characters, you absolutely had to believe that they weren't just sort of telling you stuff. And the great, wonderful thing about you know, almost 60 years of human spaceflight now is that you've got a pool of 550 people who've flown into space, all with different backgrounds in science, technology, and medicine, and the arts sometimes as well. And, and they all brought something to the science show by fine-tuning our selection to, to the episodes that way. They were a fascinating group. I have to say, we, we did a press event where we had all eight astronauts on a stage with 200 television journalists who half the time could give a shit about anything. And they <laughs> literally all stopped and paid, they were solely focused on these eight astronauts. And they see celebrities all the time. And these, these eight astronauts stopped them in their tracks. And it was fascinating. So for season two, which I'm excited, if you don't know, we are hard at work on pre-production for season two. Our storytellers are actually going to be explorers, which we're super excited about. And we're in the process of talking to a lot of people now and figuring that out, which I think is going to be really bring a whole different perspective uh, to the series. So I want to touch on something you mentioned, which is point of view, uh, which brings us to the series that we just announced a month ago, I think, called Queens. And I think we have a slide for that because we have no footage. We haven't even started shooting yet. But tell us a little bit about Queens, because I'm super, super excited about this show. I'm so excited to be doing this show. And it came about in a really interesting way. Um, for a long time, and my background is a combination of anthropology and biology, so I've been very lucky to spend time with uh, indigenous peoples around the world. Um, I was often documenting what the males were doing, and, and particularly rites of passage and all the kind of sexy stuff of guys having their heads shaved and going through dramatic rituals with bullet ants and things like that. But it was often what the women were up to that would intrigue me, and the sort of 
the, the power play that would be going on. And as I then transitioned into more uh, natural history filming work, the same thing was playing out. So um, I spent time in Gombe with the Gombe chimps. And again, there's lots of kind of shouting and screaming with what the males are doing. But as you dug into the depth of the studies that are going, in, are going on there with people like Bill Wallower, obviously under Jane Goodall's auspices, um, you realise the kind of complexity of the female uh, alliances and leadership and actually how think they're actually calling the shots. Um, so this was again happened with gelada baboons and recently I've been working uh, for two years in, in Africa filming elephants and extraordinary behaviours amongst the matriarchs, not all of it cuddly. For example, we saw a rival herd coming into a waterhole and we've been documenting um, uh, the, the particular herd in front of us and suddenly the atmosphere changed and it was war and these females came in and they were like ears flapping and they rushed forward and took a new calf away from our matriarch and it you know, just as dramatic as any kind of males in must that you might have seen. They were full on battling to get this calf back. Our matriarch went in and got her calf back. And it was incredibly dramatic. And then at another turn, you'd see extraordinary tender behaviors from our matriarch where she would, um, you know, rescued a stuck baby that wasn't even hers from certain death. So. I've become more and more intrigued in, in sort of looking at what the females within animal societies are doing. In this series, we're, we're taking the kind of female-led animal societies, matriarchal societies or matrilineal societies, and we're looking at how females compete, rise to power, hold on to power, and then what happens when they lose power. Why do you think this series has never been made before? It's kind of mind-boggling, actually, when you think about it. Maybe I think not. It, I think it starts with Darwin. <laughs> yeah. Genius that he is. Um, I think the you know the centerpiece of Darwin's theory is obviously sexual selection, and it was very much slanted towards the way males compete for females. And that again, it's it's quite easy to document and to see because it's dramatic, it's heads butting, um, and I think that has skewed science and in turn a lot of our filmmaking. So if to really look at what the females are doing, you need to spend a lot of time. You need to recognise individuals and follow how the relationships develop. And, you know, this, this story actually developed out of a relationship that I have been developing with Janet Hanvistering, where we've been talking about this subject matter and both of us feeling there was something there. And I had a smaller idea, which was Night Queens, which was to look at the kind of battles between lionesses and hyenas on the savannas at night. And I said to Janet, you know, I think, I think there's something here. And she went in classic American style, we need to supersize this. <laughs> Let's go big. Let's do the six-parter on queens of the animal kingdom. So the, the queen's idea isn't just going to be what we see on screen, but it's going to manifest itself largely behind the scenes as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, to, it's great today to be sitting here with another matriarch. <laughs> <laughs> hope you're not. <laughs> hope you're not offended by that. But um, <laughs> war. Let's get our, yeah, our ears going, ears clapping. But but actually, there aren't many female leaders in natural history filmmaking. Um, it's. I looked around in the sort of when I was developing and learning my skills, and there weren't many women amongst us. Um, so. I think it's important to try and get more voices into our industry. And it's not just about female voices. Um, we're trying to get, we're really trying to get indigenous voices from the cultures in the countries where we film, because these are the voices we need to hear. As Steve Boys was saying earlier, they are the guardians of biodiversity. So the, we very much have a bigger mission for this series so that we, in, incorporate more types of people into the, the production team and work with more types of scientists and field assistants so that we increase that diversity. Well, I know the reaction when we announced that series, both internally and within the community, was just incredible excitement. So I know it, maybe we'll have you back in like two years once we have something to show, something to show and we can yeah. share it with everyone. <laughs> so I just want to end on one last question for you all because we're out of time. <laughs> And I said I'd try to be finished on time. I didn't promise. Um, <laughs> um, 
is answer for me in a, in a tweet type sentence. If you guys could make any natural history series you wanted, what would it be? And then Courtney Monroe, our president, will pick the best one backstage and fund it. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but Chris. OK, well, I, I guess for me, being a planetary scientist, it, it would be perhaps the first documentary about the extremophiles um, in the depths of the Martian basins. So fund that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm too competitive. I'm not going to give away my uh. secrets. <laughs> Actually, I'm a marine biologist, so I still feel there's an awful lot to be done, done um, in the oceans that we haven't. You know, I think that Pla uh, Blue Planet and Blue Planet 2 were fantastic, but I think for a certain audience they were, and I think there's a lot more we could do in the oceans that will um, bring a lot more people to, to, to the marine world and the importance of it. Yep. Vanessa? I'd like to develop the first game that um, takes on the environment and evolutionary theory. So Fortnite, so take the storytelling into the space where kids are yeah. obsessed. Um, so that's, that's on my bucket list. Well, that's a different department. So now we can fund two things, right? <laughs> um, we, the work you guys do and the time you spend and the patience you have to deliver these amazing stories to our audiences all over the world. We're incredibly lucky to have you all working with us. And I just want to thank you all for, I couldn't find any American panelists. So thank you all for flying across the pond uh, to join us today. We really, really, really appreciate it. And again, we are so honored to be able to showcase the incredible work you guys do. So thank you so much and thank all of you. We just walk off this way. <laughs> Thank you. Vanessa, Martha, Chris. Well, now you know some of the faces behind these spectacular programs going on across the world. Now, our next group of speakers will highlight solutions to biodiversity loss and the different ways rewilding can be used in conservation work. Please welcome Founder and Managing Director of the American Prairie Reserve and National Geographic Explorer, Sean Garrity. Chief Marketing Officer for African Parks, Andrea Hedloff. And Founder, Executive Director of the Foundation Conservation, Carpathia, Barbara Promberger. Welcome. All right, oh, our, our clock has started, wow. Um, welcome everybody, thanks very much. We're gonna talk about rewilding today. My colleagues and I talked about it a bit over the uh, earlier part of this week. You can define it lots of different ways, uh, but basically it's restoring all original ecological processes at full ecosystem scale. And that's the trick, full ecosystem scale, really difficult. We're gonna use some land-based examples, not marine examples amongst the three of us here. But it's all about putting everything back, not just one species. It can involve nematodes, nematodes in the soil, insects, pollinators, birds, reptiles, ungulates, big predators. All of that has to come back and be back in balance for rewilding to work. So we're going to talk about these three examples. We're all at different stages along our unique paths with our project. I'm going to start with Andrea. Tell us about what rewilding looks like in African parks. Sure, thank you, Sean. So actually to quote you, rewilding is hard. Um, it often takes a series of really extreme and active human interventions to be able to either create the conditions by which wildlife can return naturally or we are bringing animals back through translocations or reintroductions. Um, just to give a little bit of context about African parks. So we're a conservation NGO. We manage national parks and protected areas on behalf of governments across Africa. We typically enter into, on average, 20-year management agreements, and we are actively rehabilitating and restoring these landscapes. 
And we do that by being 100% accountable for everything that happens in those parks. So that's the law enforcement, the wildlife, the communities, the revenue, and the infrastructure and management. Um, we currently manage 15 parks in nine countries, spanning 10.5 million hectares of, of land. Um, most of these parks that we assume management of are severely degraded, they've suffered from years of neglect, poor management, many key species have been hunted out, and they need to be restored. Because what we stand to lose and what we're hearing over and over, I think, between the last two days, is the risk of, of losing vast functioning wild landscapes is, is immense in terms of human um, well-being, and whether that's you know, clean air, clean water, carbon sequestration, uh, food security. And you might be wondering why is there an image of armed rangers jumping out of a helicopter while I'm talking about rewilding parks in Africa? Because the foundational component, what we see over and over, is safety, creating safe places through security to prevent poaching, to allow for, again, wildlife to come back naturally on their own, or to create those conditions by which we can actively reintroduce species. And what we see over and over is that the conditions that wildlife need to thrive are the same that humans need to thrive. So security, safe places, then everything else can happen thereafter. That's excellent. Thanks very much. Uh, Barbara, talk a bit about the Carpathians. What does rewilding look like uh, similar or different to what uh, Andrea is talking about? Yeah, thank you. Well, um, when we talk about Europe, wilderness is usually not the first thing that people would think about. But the continent actually has enormous potential for rewilding. And this is basically um, due to the fact that there is every year 2.5 million acres of marginal agricultural land that are being abandoned by the local farmers. So while this is normally considered a socioeconomic problem, this is at the same time also an opportunity for natural landscapes and wildlife to recover. Now, if you're talking about uh, the Romanian Carpathian Mountains, which is the area our foundation is working in and the place that I'm really passionate about, I think this is a very specific European situation because these mountains have been used and the forests there have been used uh, commercially for centuries. But still, these areas remained unfragmented, they remained largely uninhabited, and they still have most of the species in place. So for us, in our conditions, uh, rewilding really means to secure and to protect um, the last untouched islands, the last virgin and um, old growth forests in Europe, and also to take out the uh, surrounding areas, taking them out of this uh, intensive use, and eventually creating something that could be the European Yellowstone. Mm. But it also, of course, means um, there are degraded areas. We have to restore these degraded areas, giving nature a kickstart and protect the wildlife that is still existing there and eventually bring back those species that are missing at the moment. So, Sean, how does it look like in the American prairies? Uh, very similar to what you're describing. Our safety issues, thankfully, are not as severe and challenging as Andrea's, uh, but very similar to Carpathian uh, challenges. Uh, we're doing uh, almost a parallel-like project. For rewilding for us is to put a fully functioning ecosystem together, but on the grasslands. We're shooting for about 5,000 square miles. That equates to about 3.2 million acres. The biggest for Focus for us right now, because we're early on in the project, is putting together, assembling the land base. It's really, really key to have a huge land base on the grasslands uh, that you need to protect forever. We're also changing the land use once we get the land, uh, rather than for livestock, optimizing for biodiversity, and working on long-term benefits for people. And unfortunately, you have to do all three of those in parallel. You can't do them in, in, in serial. That'd be much more convenient but it has to be brought along all at the same time. Uh, we've been at this about 19 years now. We're part of uh, National Geographic's Last Wild Places at APR, and we're getting now lots of requests for how we have come this far in just a couple of decades with the land buying and all the things I just mentioned. So I think another part of rewilding for us is getting it done, but also doing it in a way that hopefully some of it 
can be replicated uh, or people can borrow or steal from our ideas to use in other parts of the world in similar types of projects. How we do land purchases, how we build an enduring organization that can uh, keep going beyond our founder, for instance, that's important. How we secure the huge funds that all of us have to chase all the time and how you solve problems, many of which feel intractable for decades on end. So um, that's kind of what it's, what it's like so far for us, rewilding. But in regard to rewilding, how do you actually decide on which species to focus and how do you actually work to achieve that? Yeah, so uh, early on, uh, we're early on, as I said. So for us, uh, because we're, we're new at examining the landscape, we're starting with the ecosystem engineers, and you've heard many people today uh, already talk about the importance of that. And by that, we also call them keystone species. And for us, it's different in every biome, right? For us, that is bison because of the way they graze, uh, just how we want to create the right kind of bird habitat and everything. It's prairie dogs, which are almost like little mercats, but uh, over 55 to 60 other species depend upon the prairie dogs for being on the landscape. They're like, they're like plankton in the ocean, extremely important. Uh, even beavers. So these things, have, they're single species that have multiple positive benefits uh, down the line to help create an environment that can support everything coming back. Those are the things we're working on right now. Following on quickly, you heard Ray a couple of hours ago talk about top predators. So that's, it's getting ready for those predators to arrive. The grizzly bears, uh, our equivalent, I'll even talk to you, Enrique, that's our equivalent of a great white shark uh, on the land. And, uh, and then the wolves, who are really important to complete the trophic uh, cascade and the predators. So um, that's what we're doing so far, yeah. Um, the clock was jumping back and forth. I like where it is now, though. <laughs> it went backwards for a while, good. Um, talk about yours, Barbara, your, your, I'm sorry, Barbara, your species. Well, I think in the Carpathian Mountains, we are in a much more favorable situation still because we luckily have most of the species still there. So we have in Romania, the largest population of large carnivores all over Europe, outside Russia. And this means we have wolves, we have brown bears, we have the Eurasian lynx, which is from its ecological role, probably comparable to the mountain lion in, in North America. And uh, the only large animals that we are indeed missing in the system are the forest dwelling bovines and they certainly have a very important impact on the on the forest dynamic and this is why we actually want to have them back but um, it's not going to be very likely that we get back the uh, aurochs so we also focus on the european bison together with other initiatives in the in the country to bring back the european bison to the carpathian mountains and they have been gone from this place for more than 100 years but we believe being a true keystone species and similar to the beavers, um, they play a very important role in diversifying and enhancing the, the habit con habitat conditions for a, a variety of other, maybe less charismatic species that nobody would think about. And um, so we also use this reintroduction of these you know, very iconic animals to um, develop ecotourism programs for the surrounding villages, and also to use it as a pack for a, for a much broader environmental education and community outreach program. But in general, our approach with all the wildlife that we have there, uh, whether it's existing or reintroduced wildlife, is we protect them on all the uninhabited areas, but really focus on, on mitigation of the conflicts between humans and wildlife humans and wildlife in, in the areas um, around the villages. So. Nice. All right, Andrea, how about you? Species. So we're sort of more landscape focused than species specific. Um, and again, it comes back to can we secure the landscape and create the right conditions to then bring back animals that were historically there. In some cases, we're looking at as recent as five, 10, you know, 20 years ago. Um, they are ex these are extreme measures to pick up animals and founding populations and to transfer them into a new system um, is expensive. It is not without risk, um, but sometimes the rewards can be really quite phenomenal. And I think it just shows the, the human sort of re-engineering of these landscapes to, to be able to do exactly what we're talking about, which is rewilding. Um, just two examples of that. Uh, between 2016 and 2017, African Park successfully moved 520 elephants 
elephants across the country of Malawi from two parks that actually had a surplus of elephants that were causing uh, negative impacts on the natural vegetation and also deadly levels of human conflict. Um, we were able to take them, we managed both of those parks and we moved 520 across the country, um, family unit by family unit, bull by bull over a two year period to repopulate a third park that again, we're responsible for managing um, that once had 1500 elephants, but over the last few decades have been hunted down to fewer than 100. And the reason we did that was to, again, release the pressure, negative impacts on these two areas, repopulate a third ecologically, but also to revitalize tourism and actually start to create a conservation-led economy. Um, here we're seeing an image of a lion. We had seven lions that we moved back to a park called Akagera National Park in Rwanda. This was in 2015. Um, also brought back rhinos in 2017. Now this again is after decades of both of those species being extirpated from not just the park but from the country. Um, what was incredible was seeing the community response to their return. Children and communities lined the streets and sang and celebrated while seeing these vehicles driving these animals back to their home. The, the homecoming they got was extraordinary and what we're seeing is in a really short period of time um, They've helped revitalize the park, not just ecologically, through tourism. Uh, the park is now 80% self-financing, bringing in $2 million a year. Uh, that goes back to the communities and goes back to the park. And last year we had 40,000 tourists visit the area, half of whom were, were Rwandan nationals, wow. coming back to celebrate this return of, of the wild. Amazing. Incredible. Yeah. Amazing, really, <laughs> absolutely. Barbara, talk about yours. Or local. I'm local, sorry. Local com communities. Local communities. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, coming. The clock is freaking me out. The uh, yeah. We're now we're going to talk about next topic is how we work with local communities. All three of us have challenges in spending enough time with that. It's extremely important. So we're just going to uh, touch on a little bit of what we, each of us are doing. So yeah. And Barbara's going to start with that. I mean, Romania. So coming from a post-communist communist country, um, many people don't believe that protected areas or conservation will actually contribute to their well-being. So it's rather the opposite. They see only the restrictions. And you can't really blame them because uh, so far, protected areas have always been imposed on them. And um, there's not a single example in the whole country where a protected area really uh, benefited local communities. So we are actually having to work towards gaining this trust and, and obtaining this trust from local communities. So key for us really is, and this is what we are trying to achieve in our project, is to change the economic situation um, from an extractive to a non-extractive use of the natural resources. And we're trying to do that by developing conservation enterprises, of course, ecotourism development, but also um, helping uh, to improve the situation for uh, local small-scale farmers, increasing the value of the products, and um, also working only with local craftsmen. But on top of that, um, we also try to create a, um, a program, a scheme, uh, which is a, a private land conservation easement scheme that ensures that private landowners that are willing to protect their forests are adequately compensated for what actually is a service that they deliver to the entire society. And we keep forgetting that. Um, what you see here on the, on the last slide is something that we do at the same time in parallel. We try to engage with local people also in our reforestation, replanting work, because what we've seen there, it really creates pride, pride in participation and also um, creates ownership of these newly created conservation areas. Beautiful. Andrea, talk about uh, local people in your area. Sure, I, I would say it's probably the most important thing that we, we do. Um, Conservation is a land use type, and it's a choice. And at the end of our 
management mandate, whether we've signed for 20 years or 50 years, we need to have realized the value of these protected areas for the local people that are living either in them or around them. Four of the parks we manage actually have tens of thousands of people legally living in those parks. Others have as many as hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people living right along the boundary. In order to value those areas as conservation land choices, local people absolutely have to, have to benefit from them. Um, and it can't be perceived benefits, they have to be real. And what we see again and again is that people want exactly the same things we want. They want to be able to send their children to school. They want health care. They want employment. They want to be able to plan for, for tomorrow. Um, and that's critical. I mean, and I think what we're seeing is the role that effectively run protected areas actually can deliver an unlocking value, ecological, but socio-political, as well as economic value, that come back in real returns. I mean, last year alone, African Parks was responsible for ensuring that 80,000 children had access to education. 82,000 people had access to health care. If those protected areas weren't being run well, they wouldn't have had that. Um, and so those are, those are the real benefits that I think will ensure that these lost of the wild, these functioning landscapes, actually will persist long into the future. Um, and I know you have worked for many years and, and worked very closely with Native American communities and, and others. So you could talk yes. a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks. I think, um, well, all of us have a different context. So uh, our context, I think they'll roll the slide up here in a second, is um, um, we're surrounded by mostly cattle ranching in our area with uh, nearly 300 large-scale cattle ranchers, both European and Native American uh, descent, running 500,000 cows and their cattle. So we had to think about how do we make them winners in this. Uh, one group we focus on is what we call progressive local ranchers, people who are interested in learning and ranching about new ways uh, in more biodiversity-friendly ways. We looked at lots of different ways to try to do that. One way, we started a, we started a food company that is a biodiversity-friendly food products company in the United States, and it's called Wild Sky. It's a program where we pay ranchers on top of what they get paid in the commodity markets to work in more biodiversity-friendly ways, and we can measure that very clearly on a nine-point scale we have. We also work with the Anani and the Nakota tribes here and they are largely supportive of this overall idea because it's bringing back a lot of the wildness that a couple hundred years ago helped define their culture. They're excited about that, not just bison, but all the animals coming back. Uh, others, uh, I know a number of people this morning, I was watching Enrique's talk uh, through the video there, talked about how protected areas can enhance uh, uh, economic opportunities over time. You have to give it time. It doesn't happen immediately. But the Nakota and Aani tribes can tell that, and particularly for their young people, they're interested in getting involved in the visitation. We, uh, I got some good coaching and advice many years ago from Beverly and Derek Jobert and others, uh, talking with them and also visiting Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa. And we finally pulled off our first ever um, naturalist guide training program, all Native American naturalist guide, first phase of it. So we just got that done. So people there are very excited to participate in that. And as we bring in hundreds of people each year already, uh, creating employment in that way. So for some of the folks we're working with, doing things differently and making more dollars, being in agriculture, and some benefiting from growing visitation. And we are out of time. I hope what you'll take from this is that rewilding is, is very challenging. It's really complicated. You gotta get enough land, you have enough, enough dollars, you have to protect it very intensely for long periods of time, and you have to benefit people in the surrounding area so they'll help take care of it in perpetuity. Thanks to National Geographic Society for giving us this time, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Barbara. So uh, ready for another one hour? No, I'm just kidding. All right, time for a quick break, 10 minutes, and we'll start the next session. Stretch your legs, leave your headsets uh, where they are, and we'll come and collect them now. Thank you all.
please welcome environmental photographer and National Geographic Explorer, R.T. Kumar Rao. It hasn't rained for 22 months in the desert. We're in the middle of a drought. I'm sitting on a dune with my friend, who's a shepherd, and when I turn to him, I see him wordlessly digging into the dune. And some six inches into the dune, he comes up with this, wet sand. It hasn't rained here for almost two years. How can this be? Welcome to the land of little rain and old magic. You are in the Thar Desert of India. We climb down from the dune, and he shows me this well. It's a hand-dug well, which is giving water. Not even three feet under, and there's water there. And there are several such wells peppered along the dunes. This is the desert. Now, the sand in the desert is a very tiny part of the desert. If you look around you, you see tons of different microhabitats, grasslands, rocky uh, deserts, all kinds of habitat, replete with flora and fauna. And everywhere you look, even on a dune, you see signs of life. The desert is alive. This is also the most populated desert in the world. And it's home to desert nomads who walk their flocks, their sheep and goat, through the desert. These are desert hardy animals. And they're also, they also give some of the choicest lamb and mutton you can find in India. They call it their walking gold. But it is a land where living is tenuous. How do these people then build in drought resilience? They have a way, an old way. Right about now, if you were to go into this desert, the sun would be blazing down, 120 Fahrenheit, about 50 Celsius. But the people would be hard at work because they would be tilling their land, prepping for that maybe that one day of rain that will fall on the catchment. This is what a desert catchment looks like, no trees. It's just flat land, flat as a pancake and hard. It's slightly elevated and it slopes down over a kilometer, about one foot over a kilometer, to a basin. And these people are hard at work collecting thorny acacia bushes and lining the far end of that basin and waiting, waiting for this. Come July, the winds are going to whip up the sands and the sandstorms are going to block the sun out of the skies and the sand's going to be thrown against the acacia bushes and a bund is going to begin to build itself. And the desert nomads will wait some more for this. Maybe that one day of rain in August, which is going to dump not even four inches of rain onto the desert. This place gets under four inches of rain the whole year, and sometimes it comes in a single day. The dune is going to drink deeply and hold the water in its belly, like we saw earlier. And the catchment is going to roll the water down, and it's going to come to rest at the bund that was created by these people. And this is going to be a rain-fed lake that will quench the thirst of this community for the next six to eight months. And then the sun is going to blaze again, and of course, as it must, the water will dry up or be sucked into the land. And then there's a reprieve. You see, this land has a layer of gypsum running underneath it so that it doesn't allow the sweet water of the rain to mix with the salty saline aquifers of the desert. It keeps it fresh. And they have hand dug wells that pull in the water as you pull up the water. And so, for another eight to 10 months, they are covered because they have wells. I was walking through this desert with Paul Salopek, 
um, on the Out of Eden Walk, and we encountered tons of these rainwater harvesting structures, and they sustained us just like they have sustained merchants and pastoralists um, along the Silk Route for years. Uh, Paul was it, was, it was a 46 uh, Celsius, 115 Fahrenheit day, and he pulled up some water and he you know, doused his head with a little bit, and we had a shepherd run out of his hut saying, no, that's our drinking water, please don't use it for this. So that's how they take care of their water, and they have water security. Fine, that's water security, what about food? This is another piece of magic. The water rolls down that same catchment and comes to stop at the bund. I'm standing on a 700-year-old bund. 700-year-old bund. And Chhattar Singh, my shepherd friend, has revived an ancient method of desert agriculture, which Basically, they wait for this water to seep into the ground. They do not use it, they do not defile it. They just wait for the water to seep into the ground. And when it's all gone, the shepherds become farmers for a day and they sow their land and then they wait again. And when November comes, come the crops and it's a time of plenty. You have wintering demoisel cranes that come in, you have all kinds of wildlife that take, um, take shelter in these, um, in these fields. These people have gone from being beggars to being rupee millionaires just after resurrecting this ancient method of desert agriculture. So you see the desert. It's food and fodder. It supports wildlife and livelihoods, all within nature. But here's the bad news. It had to come, right? Here's the bad news. The Indian government labels deserts as wastelands. Not just deserts, scrub deserts, scrub forests, peat bogs, wetlands, grasslands. They're all called wastelands to be better utilized. And by better utilized, they mean all kinds of things. For the desert, they're raising the desert, they're raising the grasslands, they're piping water in from the Himalayas all the way to the desert. The problem is, by the time that water gets to the desert, it's putrid. And this part of the desert of Chhattar Singhs that had never seen a mosquito before now has the highest incidence of malaria in Rajasthan. The water is what stinks with floating carcasses. The people refuse to consume it. They prefer to rely on their own rainwater harvesting. This is the desert that we're losing. What's happening is it's being checkered with windmills and transmission lines. I walked down this row of windmills, 20 windmills, and at the base of nine of them, here's what I found. Dead griffin vultures. This is also the home to the great Indian bustard, which is one of the most critically endangered species which, of which there are about only 150 individuals remaining. And in the recent past, we've lost three of them to collisions with windmills and transmission lines, three that we cannot afford to lose. These are outside protected areas. These animals live outside protected areas. These are not protected areas. These are desert grassland commons. So the, the government has been disemboweling the desert. It labels it a wasteland, and then it disembowels it and creates from a living desert a dust bowl. I'm going to pause here and ask you to consider these two words, desert, dust bowl. Desert, dust bowl. A desert is alive. A dust bowl is not. And yet, we, when we refer to a human devastated landscape or a human created dust bowl, why do we call it desertification? I'd like us to think about language because language is what has led to a lot of these policies. When we lay waste to um, an agricultural a farm and the, and the soil becomes saline and the wind whips up white sand and nothing grows there, we call it a desert? No, it's a dust bowl. When we cull predators and the herbivores graze down a mountainside and the topsoil is washed away, we call it desertification? No, that is a dust bowl. When we bottom trawl an ocean and make it devoid of all life, 
that is not an ocean desert. It's a dust bowl. When governments label vital ecosystems as wastelands, it is a dire and dangerous mistake. But when we, storytellers, educators, editors, scientists, communicators, when we confuse the terms, we are perpetuating that mistake and we are not cutting these vital and very, very maligned ecosystems any slack. If we want the next generation, if we want our kids to understand, care about, and act to conserve these vital ecosystems, we need to role model it with language. Let us then jettison old, tired, inaccurate similes and metaphors like as barren as a desert, or drain the swamp, or big bad wolf, or as Patricia was saying yesterday, as dumb as a tapir, or jackass, I've walked 600 kilometers with a jackass, not Paul Salopek, I mean a real jackass. <laughs> and, and I know that this is an intelligent creature, hardworking creature. We just malign ecosystems and animals with language. Language matters. Words are powerful because as we think, so are our words. As are our words, so is our intent. As is our intent, so is our action. And as is our action, so is our destiny. Thank you. Thank you, Arati. Thank you, Arati. Some beautiful images there. Now, we all know that technology plays a big part in all of this. And to kick things off, I'd like to welcome Senior Director of Graphic Visualization Lab at National Geographic Society, Steve Brumby. Hey there, I'm Steve Brumby, and uh, what, we've been, what we're talking about here now is data-driven conservation. So we've been, um, and let me, okay. So we, we've been collecting data about conservation for a very long time. And the issue is, how do we know we have enough data? If we have data, how do we know that it's actually being helpful, right? How do we actually engage with the technology communities that create new sensors, the folks who have to assemble data into useful systems, and then the folks who have to actually communicate that, the results of all of that work to local communities to achieve change, okay? Um, when I was on this stage a year ago, uh, I, I announced that um, National Geographic was looking to build a new data platform to help supply the tools to enable data-driven conservation. And the EarthPulse platform that we're actually announcing right now is the culmination of that last year of work. Um, so EarthPulse, is a system that's designed to bring together all of this best data, but not just produce a big vat of data. There's, there's a number of systems already that have large amounts of data. We want to curate that data, data that goes from the bottoms of the oceans to, 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 the, to space and beyond. We want to bring all that together, and we want to put it to the use of understanding, let's see, next one, okay, to understand our species, the habitats, the impacts that our actions are having on species and habitats, and the impacts that we're having on ourselves, okay? Um, and then to assess the impact of our responses to those, um, to those pressures, which we do through protected areas. And so we have a system of, of information summary dashboards um, that are automated and provide a continually updated view of every protected area in the world and of all of the um, you know, species extents and all sorts of stuff up to countries that can help inform essentially a dashboard for the planet. Right? So as we move towards trying to move the international community to achieve 30% protection of the world by 2030, we want to give them the tools to do that. So um, right now we're going to be joined by, my, uh, by a series, a very distinguished panel of, of folks who are going to help us talk through these issues of how you achieve real practical data-driven conservation. So we're going to be joined by Katie Croft-Bell, um, who's an oceanographer and National Geographic Fellow, Naftali Honig, Director of Research and Development at Garamba National Park in Democratic Republic of Congo with the African Parks Network, also a National Geographic Fellow, Bronwyn Agrios, a space entrepreneur and National Geographic Fellow, and Africa Flores Anderson, Research Scientist at the University of Alabama and National Geographic Explorer. Please welcome the panel.
Okay, thanks for joining us. So, uh, first question is to Katie. So, 95% of the oceans are still essentially unexplored, right? Um, how do we evolve beyond um, having very expensive crewed missions to try uh, crewed C R E W E D uh, <laughs> missions? It can be crewed also <laughs> sometimes. To to, uh, to explore the rest of the volume, and if we explore the rest of the volume, what do we do with all that data? Excellent question, Steve. Uh, so, I think that. It's a really exciting time for oceanography and exploration and discovery in general because there have been so many um, advances being made in other industries with low cost electronics and sensors and robotics. Think about the supercomputer that is in every pocket in this room right now that has more computing power than every computer combined that put people on the moon. Right? So there's so much possibility in terms of the low cost robotics to be able to create a truly distributed, more efficient system than we've ever had before. As you, as you mentioned, the big ships, the big robots cost tens of millions of dollars a year to operate, and they really only look at a very small fraction of the seafloor, very, very well, mind you, with incredible detail. But we really need to cover a much, much larger area and get a sense of the lay of the land, and then send those very detailed assets um, back there. But as you mentioned, what, what do we then do with the data? Um, and before I go on, um, there are a couple of projects I've been working on in the, the sort of low-cost robotic space. One is with the Exploration Technology Lab, um, the guys in the basement, and that is to use the drop cameras, you can see just sort of off the screen here, um, to work with communities in small island developing states to be able to explore their own deep seas. Um, so in addition to the technologies, you also need to look at who is gonna be um, deploying these, these different kinds of assets and expanding um, what it means to be an ocean explorer. So you can't just have a handful of PhDs, oceanographers, you also need to have a, a much bigger um, community. So um, we have this program going on called My Deep Sea, My Backyard, and we also have another, if we can go to the next slide, um, which is developing um, underwater Lego robots, um, which has been very, very fun. And we did a National Geographic student expedition last summer um, with, with these little vehicles. And so we're continuing to develop them and see what we can do to really bring um, these kinds of assets to, um, to students, to, to really everyone. But then you get to, what do you do with the data, right? I'll, right. I'll let Naftali. <laughs> okay, thank you. So Naftali. Um, science and exploration leads to new senses. When you're trying to protect you know, areas, conservation areas in re very remote and often very troubled regions of the world, what are you thinking about in addition to the senses so that you can actually build it into a system that actually has impact? So um, what you're seeing on the screen here is, um, is doing some aerial mapping. We had our friends from Virtual Wonders, Corey Jaskowski and Chris Milburn come through um, a few months ago. You can see how huge Garamba is. And, um, and so obviously, yeah, it's a, it's a very vast remote landscape. Um, this is just an example here of some imagery uh, that was taken uh, with those flights. Um, this is a three, so not only is it vast, but it's also a conflict area where we have conflict in neighboring Central African Republic and South Sudan. So this is a refugee settlement um, in South Sudan. And just an example here is, um, I mean, this is, uh, this is how, we can, how we can conduct change detection uh, over time. Um, and you, you could imagine that we would want to do that for refugee settlements or for illegal mines. But here you can see um, even a small path if you look closely. Um, and you could imagine um, also wanting to have wildlife collars. Uh, that's a pretty typical sensor in protected areas. And then you can imagine if you identified paths using this, this imagery that you might want to place a camera there. So then you have to figure out, okay, well, what, are the, what, what do we need in terms of a camera? Um, or anything to de detect poachers. And you have to think of the testing, right? Has it been tested before it's come out? You can't, you can't go to the hardware store if you're in the middle of the DRC. So um, we probably have one maybe a few hundred kilometers away, so not really ideal. You have to think of timetables. So if somebody is designing a camera for conservation or a product for conservation, we can't just wait forever for these things to, to come out. Um, you know, the, the pace of technological development is fast. So uh, we need people to, to, who are interested in developing technology to respect timetables. And, uh, and we also um, have to think about transmission. So how do you get a signal from a sensor? Um, a lot of these places don't have mobile phone access. 
uh, they, they, you, so we have to think of a satellite solution or, or a LoRa solution or something like that. Right. And so that brings up um, uh, Bronwyn, who uh, sits out in Silicon Valley. And a lot of the technology, not so much the science sensor, but the rest of the chain that Naftali just described, the comms and the computing and the power systems that can work in remote areas, a lot of those are really dual-use technology that industry is developing, and Silicon Valley is at the center of that type of development. Where, where do you see the big opportunities for conservation to sort of leverage that progress that's happening without getting eaten alive by the scale of the industrial investments that are being made? Yeah, for sure. Um, Last week, NPR reported on a retrospective from Hurricane Michael, this Category 5 storm that ripped through Florida last year with 160 mile per hour winds. And they quoted a local mayor saying, had we known sooner that the storm was going to be so severe, everyone would have left. Right. Accurate, timely forecasting of hurricane wind speeds can absolutely change the way we address impact. And for the past 50 years, it's really been meteorologists that look at the imagery, look at the clouds, and now make a, a wind speed forecast every six hours. So okay, this, this might sound a little funny, but if you look at every storm, every year, every six hours, those meteorologists know a lot. And now the world has a record of all of those storms. And in our current age of AI, having a scientifically validated data set that describes Earth's systems is absolute gold. So in addition to a scientist or meteorologist looking at a single image, you now have computer vision looking at an image and thousands of historical curated, uh, validated uh, images that can provide accurate, timely wind speeds. Uh, so my, my friends at Development Seed with NASA did exactly this last year. They built an AI that ran for, that detected a, uh, an uptick in wind speeds for Hurricane Florence from category two to category three, a full day before the National Hurricane Center advisory came out. That's you know, the difference between limbs falling off of trees and the trees being completely uprooted. Right? So they're using the new NOAA set of satellites called GOES that observe the entire Western Hemisphere every five minutes. Okay, so if we tack on an extra minute to downlink that data from 35,000 kilometers above the planet, run it through the AI, process the image, and send that forecast off, for, that forecast off to the API, in six minutes, we're now forecasting storms like never before. So again, we just went from six hours to six minutes. That is step function change. Okay. So after you've done all this fancy tech and you've brought in the latest and greatest commercial off the shelf, right? Somebody still needs to actually use the result, mm -hmm. right? So Africa, you've been out in Guatemala working with the local communities, um, helping them understand toxic algal blooms. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenges to the sort of capacity building that's needed at the community level or the government, local governmental level to help with the adoption of these technologies so that they're actually used. Yeah, so government instability. That's the biggest challenge we have faced. And this is Lake Atitlan, as you can see, one of the most beautiful places on earth, and no bios because I'm from there, <laughs> but uh, it is. And um, <laughs> we are using satellite remote sensing to monitor uh, the algae blooms that have been appearing since 2009. But uh, with CERVIL, which is a partnership between NASA and USAID, we work with government to build the capacity to use air observation data for improved decision making. And uh, we work with governments because they are the ones who have the mandate to monitor and protect their own country resources. And uh, we develop systems and tools that are very useful. And then uh, there is a high turnover of technical people and officials. So we had uh, addressed this in different ways. One of that is uh, involving academia more and more. So we are empowering the next generation of uh, professionals that are going to take those positions. And uh, the other that I think has been the success of Servir 
is partnering with local experts. So in Servir, we work in Africa, in Asia, and uh, in Latin America. We just start working in the Amazonia right now. And uh, in these regions, Servir is not a bunch of scientists back here in NASA but uh, they are local experts. So for example, in Eastern and Southern Africa, we partner with the Regional Center of Mapping of Resources for Development, uh, who are from Kenya and from the countries uh, in Eastern and Southern Africa. And they are the ones who are providing the backstopping and uh, working with governments and even with this high turnover of government officials. We have a stable science and knowledge and we co-develop uh, tools together. Right. So, what are the real tricks to achieving impactful data-driven conservation? Is to open the links between the different folks who are on this table, uh, on this panel. So, um, Niftali, what would you say is the biggest opportunity that you have to like learn from uh, one of the others? Um, I think that there is a whole new field now, especially with mapping, to do it in an integrated fashion. So I think that bringing in other people's data has never been easier, um, and sending out your own data has never been easier. So I think there's a, a ton of opportunity there to, to, share, um, to share more easily. So Bronwyn knows a lot around, about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, de definitely. Um, you know, I, I, to me, I think the, one of the big opportunities to collaborate um, comes from this just like this shared DNA that I've felt the past like couple days between entrepreneurs and explorers, right? Everybody in this room is obsessed with going into the unknown, right? Uh, tech entrepreneurs have the same thing. We're all looking for the best tools. And um, I mean, I'm working on a program right now with National Geographic Labs and uh, to bring that kind of tighter connection between the explorers and the entrepreneurial investing community in Silicon Valley that I think will, will help to kind of bridge, bridge those gaps, allow for you know, a lot of things that Naftali was just talking about as well. I personally, I think, could learn a lot from, from Africa. I'm certainly guilty of the sort of parachute science model where you bring a ship in, you do a thing, you maybe hand some people locally a hard drive, and then you go away. Um, and so that's definitely one of the things that I would like to work on personally is how can we bring deep sea science to more people who have not um, been engaged in, in it. And so I would love to learn more from Africa about their community building and, and how to engage with local communities in science. Yeah, that, and uh, that's what we do at Servir. And uh, we bring the science, we are that bridge between science and an application. And uh, we are working with a lot of scientists. We are scientists ourselves, but uh, we also respect and acknowledge that there is wisdom and information that we need. Like everything that we generate with satellite remote sensing needs to be validated and calibrated. We need in situ observations. We need data from the field. And uh, there is a lot of local knowledge. And for me, it's sometimes even funny to see that there are scientists working in Colombia, in Peru, that are using, uh, are making a better use of satellite data than scientists down here, because they are actually using to take an, an action to identify deforestation so that's, but we are yeah always open and we like to work together that's how Servir has come about working together yeah. uh, Broadman what would you say is the biggest myth about your piece of this what, what do you think is the biggest thing with the rest of the conservation community misunderstands for example about Silicon Valley um, yeah you know one of the things that Africa and I were talking about yesterday is that she's having trouble acquiring imagery for one of her programs, right? And she can't afford it, the license isn't available, and it, it really just brings to light that even for academic programs or nonprofit programs, um, especially for commercial programs, that the economics and the business model of Earth observation are, aren't really very well defined, um, and they're, they're, still, they're still very much in flux, which I think, um, has an impact on, on the community as we've seen over the past couple of days because there's been so many references to satellite imagery. So I think the, the myth is that maybe space is figured out, right? <laughs> but. And I will say for anybody who's an explorer in the audience that there are specific programs. Any explorer wants to get some satellite imagery, come and talk to me. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
Okay, Steve has it figured out. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? What's, what's your biggest myth? How about Naftali? I mean, people give you a sensor and say, hey, you must have saved all the animals by now. <laughs> Um, certainly, certainly, that's that's one myth um, that that there's that there that that you can look at sensors in isolation um, and not see not see the fact that you need a sensor, you need a, a method to transmit that, and that you need a system to integrate that data and to analyze it. Um, and I think another big myth is that those systems. I mean, we built out a system with um, with a lot of help from National Geographic and from Esri. Um, and I think a big myth there is that you need some sort of super specialization and mapping to be able to uh, implement that in a park, when in fact um, you can actually uh, with you can actually train uh, capacity locally, and you can sort of have a specialist pretty easily in each park. And nowadays the tools that are available are are easy enough to learn that that this type of location intelligence and sort of better, more in-depth analytics is possible in every park. Africa? Biggest myth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, definitely, I, I will think that this uh, thinking that data and technology itself is going to solve the biggest environmental issues that we have today, and we forget about the people that are at the core of these environmental issues. So, integrating that, acknowledging that, I think that scientists have to be humble enough to recognize that we have to work together, that there is knowledge out there, and uh, that that we need it. Uh, so for me, that's uh, one of the, the, the biggest myths. Yeah. Katie? I think one, maybe it's not a myth, but rather maybe a misconception. Okay. Like you hear all the stats about 95% haven't been explored, all this stuff, and then you go to Google Earth, and then you see there's the bottom of the ocean right there. Uh -huh. um, and yet, uh, the data that's there is very, very low resolution. Like you see the big bumps, you see the mid-ocean ridge, but you really don't know what is there. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, I think, you know, when you look at all these beautiful maps, they make you feel like you know what's there, but really there's so much left to explore. Yeah, I, I'm originally from Australia, which was terra incognito for a long time, <laughs> but for Westerners. Um, okay, so final question in just 30 seconds, like lightning round. What is your most optimistic view of where we're going to be like five years from now? Africa? I think it's already happening. I see this room, I see the explorers, and I see so much diversity, and that brings so much hope. I think that uh, I really want to applaud Nagio's uh, effort or work to really be diverse and giving voice to those that haven't been here for so long. I think that we still need to do more. And uh, for example, bring indigenous peoples um, that I, it has been said here at this stage several times, but uh, I see a change that I, this is my, the first time, so I, this, this is very positive. Katie? Um, mine's longer than five years, but <laughs> I think that with a combination of low-cost tools, data analytics, and communities, um, it is very possible to have any community in the world with deep sea waters to be able to explore and understand their own resources for themselves. Cool. Naftali? I think that in five years' time, with the development, the faster-paced development of technology, I think that it's fair to say that um, animal tracking, so wildlife tracking, um, and other sensors, remote sensing, um, uh, various types of camera traps, I think that's going to become, and, and the systems that you, you analyze the data within, um, I think it's going to become much more ubiquitous um, and successful and useful over the next five years. Right, for better and worse. Mm. Uh, because you guys said all the things, you know, <laughs> diversity, data analytics, ubiquitous use of technology, I'm going to say hamburgers? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, everybody, I hope everybody in this room is following the Beyond Meats IPO. Um, this is, I hope that in five years I start seeing satellite, from satellite imagery, um, the, you know, the rebirth of jungles and that the microsatellites tracking methane emissions are detecting, you know, reduction in emissions because of things like Beyond Meat, like plant-based meat products that are, you know, worth, you know, 10 billion dollars, uh, you know, on the market these days, so. All right, an impossible burger too. And All right, let's thank our panelists. Okay. Well, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Africa. All right. Now, 
To finish up today, I'm looking forward to this last segment. It's about hope, five reasons to hope. And I don't need to say much else than that. There are very few people in the National Geographic family who can make me more hopeful or, or energized than our host for this last segment. Who's a better close to the, to the day than Paul Rose? Come on out, Paul. Expedition leader for National Geographic. Thank you, Sandesh. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. Well, thanks, Sandesh. And this has been a fantastic day, a, a day that's right up my street. You know, it's been billed as the headline of hope. But of course, we've carried with it everything else that goes with a successful project. You know, the ambition and commitment and technical brilliance and incredible successes. So we've celebrated that today in a brilliant way. This has really been quite something. So now to sort of focus our minds on why we have reasons to hope, we've got five representatives with their projects. There's not many out of all the projects we have. We've managed to narrow it down to five. So we've got a conservation educator. And there's nothing more vital at the moment. Boy, do we need conservation educator. We've got someone from the very front line of that conflict that exists between wildlife and humanity. We've got the future of food, food security, which we all know it's always been an issue, and now it's become an absolute urgent crisis. And we've even got something called hoofless meat and finless fish, which, when I say that, sounds a lot like the perfect name for a rock and roll band. I mean, if I was walking past the Lucky Bar this evening and it said tonight, it's hoofless meat and the finless fish, I'd be straight in there. Who could resist it? But it isn't. Two very separate um, cell-based uh, food products. Very, very exciting business. So we're going to get going. I'm going to introduce Carmen. Um, Carmen Chavez. Um, she's a tropical biologist, National Geographic explorer. So come on out, Carmen. Have fun. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I come from a part of the world that is not only beautiful and rich, as we all know, the Amazon rainforest, it's home for many thousands of plant species, animals, and ev everything else that is awaiting to be discovered. Also, it's home to many indigenous cultures and, and people and groups. But what is a little bit n not understood so well sometimes is that there's millions of people that are not originally from this area, and they are settled there. In the case of the Amazon region uh, of Madre de Dios in Peru, for example, most of the people have arrived from the Andes. They have immigrated in the search of opportunities and looking a better, better future for their families. Some are there for decades, cutting down the forest. And in the most recent years, many are just coming lured by the gold that is found in the rivers and in the, in the sediments. 20 years ago, I was very lucky to go to the Manu River. I was surrounded by many scientists, environmentalists, and researchers that taught me so much about the forest. And I learned to appreciate this place and to love it. And I made my mission in life to help protect this environment. Along with the Amazon Center for Environmental Education and Research, an organization known as the ACR Foundation, we have been working tirelessly to educate the people that are actually living in this area already. We provide with um, opportunities that they can learn to, to appreciate this, this area from the inside out. We meet with hundreds of school children and thousands of people in the Amazon, in the Madre de Dios region. I want to introduce you to Gloria Carrasco, the woman who is carefully examining these leaves. I um, was teaching a course in botany and restoration, and she came from the Andes to the Amazon 25 years before. And um, she's a dedicated teacher, and when we were walking in, the, in, in a trail, I pointed out to this tree that it's an important um, element in, in, the, in the area, uh, uh, the shiringa tree, the rubber tree. I didn't know what it meant for Gloria, but she just, just jumped out of the trail, ran to have this tree, and tears were coming down from her eyes. 
I didn't know that in her 25 years living in the Amazon, she never had the opportunity to see this tree. She knew about the importance of this species. She knew that this species changed the way we live currently in the modern times. Now she's teaching her own students about this place. I'm taking her class to see this very same tree. Thanks to the support of the National Geographic, we are reaching even more people. And we believe that we are going to be able to save this place from the inside out. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Carmen. And this is it, conservation education. Yeah, this, is, this gives us hope. Thank you very much. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Eric. Um, Eric Schultz is the Vice President of Product and Regulation of Memphis Meats. I made the joke about Hoofless meat. So, Eric, you're not in a rock band, are you? No. Oh, okay, well, come out anyway. Have some fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, Memphis Meats makes real animal meat directly from real animal cells in a process we call cell based meat production. From a single rice grain sized biopsy, we can produce an entire cow's worth of meat in the same time it takes, takes to produce a cow, roughly two to three years. In a facility the size of a brewery, we expect to produce our meat using less inputs, producing less waste, and using no antibiotics whatsoever. So I'm going to do a quick straw poll. There's cell-based meat on here, and there's conventional chicken. Both are raw. With a quick show of hands, who thinks the one on the left-hand side of your screen is cell-based? One on the right. <laughs> if you guessed the one on the left, you'd be incorrect. The one on the right is cell-based chicken. It's a question I get asked the most. What does your product look like? Well, it looks like real meat because it is real meat made from the same things that meat is made from. Now, on the left hand, on the left -hand side of your screen, you have a, the cell-based meatball we debuted in 2016 and the world's first cell-based chicken in 2017. And I can personally test these products are delicious. I get to eat them every day. It's the, my favorite part of my job. So you might get to ask yourself, we want to share them with the world. So how do, why do we even bother producing cell-based meat in this, uh, and poultry and seafood in this way? Well, simply because in Memphis Meats, we hope for a world of and, not ors. Too often, progress is pitted as a false choice uh, against tradition versus innovation, past versus future. But if you look at the history of civilization, all innovations start as an earnest attempt to preserve our most cherished human traditions. And at the center of that is food and food innovation. And as we move forward to build ourselves as, into a sustainable planetal species, and hopefully a sustainable interplanetary species, food must remain at the center of that innovation. And we're facing an innovative challenge right now. You see, by 2050, the world's population is expected to hit 10 billion people, a little less than 3 billion more than today. Meat demand is expected to double in that time. In order to meet that demand, we're going to have to produce a staggeringly large 140 billion animals and use most of the arable land to grow the plants, to feed the animals, to feed us. So humanity has an interesting challenge facing it. Now, on, this, on the surface of it, it feels like an us versus them choice, but it doesn't have to be. You see, we don't have to either choose eating meat or having a sustainable planet. No, we can have our meat and eat it too. You see, it's going to take innovation in all sectors, from conventional animal farming, small-scale sustainable farming, and cell-based methods, all putting innovation together to feed a growing world. If we're going to feed billions safe and delicious food, we'll have to work with more creativity, purposeful hope, and more technical discipline. And in doing so, feeding the world will allow us to have that safe and affordable food, and do it in a way that preserves our most cherished human traditions, and allows us to build a safe and sustainable planet. And at Memphis Meets, we hope and believe we're building that world now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eric. True, you know, this is a revolution, you know, feeding us by revolution, but you can't go wrong. Um, and if you think about a rock band, just get in there. Um, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce Laylee. It's Laylee Lichenfield is a conservationist, National Geographic explorer, and she works at that incredibly dangerous and challenging front line that exists, which is the conflict between humans and wildlife. Come on, Laylee, have fun. Meet Lala a magnificent young lion in northern Tanzania. He's banded together with two of his brothers to dominate a territory just outside of Terengiri National Park, a land that is also ruled by the Maasai people. Lala might not be alive today if not for the story I'm about to tell you. 
Now, Lala means sleep, and I often think of him lying around dreaming of becoming this beautiful boy. Just a wee bit of mean envy, perhaps. Um, but Lala is a wonderful lion, and he's living in an area where there are a lot of people, and we've got to keep him safe. And I remember a day when lions like this would roar nightly around our home in the bush. And then I remember a time when it all went silent. And lions were being killed rapidly for human-lion conflict, for killing livestock. And as a result, uh, we were losing the lion. And it was an age-old conflict. People were trading in their spears for poison and guns, new age weapons. But there was a sense among the people that something wasn't right, even among themselves. And so we sat together and we decided under a tree to innovate together. Co-creation, that's at the foundation of our work at African People and Wildlife. The result was living walls, environmentally friendly, predator-proof corrals that were co-designed with the Maasai people. They keep lions safe from livestock, uh, lions safe from people, and livestock safe from lions. And as a result, we've been able to reduce the killing dramatically. Living walls are a mighty icon of the power of community engagement, of the importance of linking traditional knowledge with modern day science. It's incredibly important to recognize the strength that happens when we come together for a local and balanced solution to the challenges our planet faces. When we have a living wall, we have something that is with the community. It's done together in partnership. And it's been a catalyst in our work for a model of how we build community engagement, a global movement for community-driven conservation where rural people really are at the helm of the work that's being done. This is Raphael Syria. He says that living walls have transformed his life. From his own calculation, he used to lose 25% almost of his livestock to wild carnivores. And his family were exhausted because they were protecting the livestock at night. They weren't sleeping. The area around their corral was denuded as they constantly went out to fortify the corrals. And he says that both the physical and the financial investment that he's made in Living Walls has made a huge difference because now his livestock is safe. And now uh, his family are, can rest at night and the, the habitat is coming back. And this, this powerful innovation that came working with local communities, it benefits men and I'm very proud to say also women because the women are often responsible for fortifying the crowds. And they say that living walls save them time. And also with the livestock safe, that keeps the, the women uh, you know, from being blamed when an animal is killed or even potentially persecuted. So they're more proud and they have more peace uh, in their lives. So what does this mean? This is a reprieve for lions. The roar of the lions has finally come back to this landscape. We are seeing signs of lion recovery. And this is Lala's brother, just recently seen consorting with this lioness just only two weeks ago. And so very soon, the next generation will be trotting out on this landscape in a world where true partnerships and long-term partnerships with local communities make it possible to actually find the balance. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Lely. I can't imagine, you know, it's a sense of working in such a challenging condition and seeing it through that perspective where success is measured by hearing the roar of the lions. You, know, you can't go wrong. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Brian. Brian is from Finless Fish. And it's not a rock band, is it, Brian? Just to make sure. No. And uh, uh, Brian uh, Wyrus is the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Finless Foods. So come on, Brian. Have some fun out here. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Fish meat is some of the healthiest protein a person can consume. High amounts of omega-3, omega-6, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you know it's going to be a healthy meal. But that has been changing. The world's ocean is getting more and more polluted. And unfortunately, these pollutants are entering the fish, fish's body and affecting our health. So, Mercury accumulation is something of a well-known fact, but unfor unfortunately, this isn't a natural phenomenon. Um, essentially, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, 
This is because we, uh, as a species, uh, introduced mercury into the ocean's ecosystem all those years ago. So we're affecting the health of the fish as a species. We're also affecting the ocean's ecosystem. So um, essentially, as we have more and more of these pollutants there and taking out tons and tons of fish from the sea, we are uh, disrupting the delicate balance that we see in the ocean. And just to add to this very, very depressing uh, uh, list of things, um, overfishing is also a social issue. Somali pirates, before they were pirates, were actually fishermen. International fishing fleets came into their waters and took all the fish out of their sea. So with hungry mouths to feed, they resorted to uh, violence. Now, despite all of this, the, dis the consumption of seafood is going nowhere but up. Essentially, um, we have uh, a flat line on how much seafood we get out of the ocean's ecosystem, and that's because we can't pump out any more efficiency. So what comes in, to, uh, in for the rescue? Aquaculture. Um, aquaculture does have also its slew of problems, so a lot of the feed that is introduced for aquaculture comes from the ocean, so you're not really circumventing a lot of those issues, as well as the systems of inputs and outputs. Um, it's not really efficient. We're spending resources on feed that turns into skin, bone, muscle, and blood and other uh, things. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could change 100% of this resource into 100% the product? At Finless Foods, we do exactly that. We take a high quality fish stock, we isolate the cells that are responsible for meat production, mainly muscle, fat, and connective tissue, and we grow that out in huge, huge uh, quantities, and then blend these three elements together to create uh, a structured product for people to enjoy, a fish fillet. Uh, I'm very happy to say that we uh, succeeded in our project. Um, we grew fr fish protein outside the body of the fish for uh, human consumption for the first time on uh, September 8th of 2017. And those cells were um, actually part of that project. And what we're doing right now is scaling up our process uh, so we could change the way we eat seafood forever. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks very much, uh, Brian. And I love it, I spend my life working at sea to help create large marine protected areas to save the ocean, and Brian's work's gonna do that. You're probably gonna be a billionaire very soon, Brian. <laughs> uh, next, we're, next up is, is Caleb from Future Food Systems. And you know, we do see a lot in the press about food security for the future, but only in the last few months has it become an absolute crisis and we need to act and what are we going to do? Well, luckily, we've got people like Caleb. Uh, Caleb is Director of the Open Agriculture Initiative, MIT, Media Lab and the National Geographic Explorer. So come on, Caleb, finish it off for us. Thank you. Hello, you, you few, you proud audience dwellers. Hello to the courtyard that's warm. Um, I'm Caleb. When I arrived here in 2015, I was like a super misfit. I was a lonely food explorer. And all of my friends that have become family now were talking about all the coolest things, like oceans. And they were like, oceans are the best. They were like, but algal blooms, they suck. And I was like, I know what causes algal blooms. It's agriculture. And they were like, habitat destruction is the worst. We're losing all these animals. We're doing all these projects. And I was like, I know what's taking the habit. It's, it's, it's agriculture. The answer to almost all the things that the people care about in this room has a thread through the basic human endeavor of agriculture. So if we're going to talk about these issues seriously, we have to be very much invested as National Geographic and as explorers and as a community in the future of food. You just heard about growing fish in, in, in uh, lab environments. If this was your first time, then you're like, ew, and crazy, and awesome, and you're feeling a lot of emotions. <laughs> I would say that we're at the beginning of a new agricultural revolution, and I just want to point that out because agricultural revolutions radically change human history. They are the bedrock of why we have, why we have societies to begin with. We stop chasing each other around. Uh, why, why we have all the technologies that we have. And so we're at the beginning of this next one, and it's, a, it's going to be about the most boring thing you can imagine. It's going to be about accounting. If you're gonna do accounting for where things came from, what they're made of, you're gonna need a machine. 
And so people often see what I'm about to tell you about on my work side, and they always see the apps. They're like, oh, you could grow this in that place, and oh, vertical farming, and it's very cute. They miss the machine underneath. So quickly, I'll show you the machine, and then I'll show you some of the apps that make it real. First step in my process is called encode. I build boxes of all different sizes, and what they're really doing is turning atoms into bits. We've heard about this before. It was called the internet. It was this cool thing. So taking real things, making them digital so that we can understand them in the space of the 21st century. So that's encode. Decode becomes now we have all this data, metabolomics data, gas chromatography data, um, you know, image-based data, sensor-based data. We have oceans of data. But how do we start to decode it? How do we find advanced relationships? So this is where kind of machine learning and artificial intelligence enters the game. But then the next step, because all that means nothing if the information doesn't create knowledge. So we encode, we, we decode, and then we recode. We have to work on bringing those things into the real world. So I'm going to leave the abstract now and go to the tangible. When I was here in 2015, I had a weird little box that grew, uh, that grew plants. Uh, and I've been on this journey since because when I went to school gardens, I was broken hearted with uh, Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign and all that to find out that almost every school garden that opens closes within three years despite having massive amounts of funding. So I thought a climate and a classroom, that's what we need to build. And now I'm happy to say that we've actually launched a whole nonprofit that's been putting these things out into the world, maker kits for gathering data, doing coding, doing electronics, uh, and doing climate science and doing plant science. It's called the personal food computer. I have no time, so I'm going to keep going fast. It's gone around the world. I've held Nat Geo hackathons with kids making their own. These are people in Baltimore. I just randomly picked it out of our community. They're, they're all over the place. The next one. So I build bigger boxes, and inside of these bigger boxes, I produce things like medicine. All medicine came from plants. Then we synthesized it, uh, made, OK, I won't go off into that land. But let's just say you can use climate science to decode a plant's ability to express the chemistries that we're interested in. We call that flavor. It's also called medicine. It's also called nutrition. And so I study how do you do that in these new advanced environments. But more than that, 80% of the world currently relies on plant-based medicine. Some of the medicines I work on are a million dollars a kilo that you can grow in these containers that can now bring chemotherapy drugs to a lot of other places. The next thing that I do in my boxes that's important to tell you, I work on what do I grow in a box that tells me where to grow in the world? How can I learn by experimenting with climates of the past, present, and future what I should plant in the face of adaptation? And I've made this real with a Ferrero, one of my sponsors that makes Kinder and Nutella and a lot of other things you might like. I actually look for places in the world. I climate prospect them. I use their weather data. I reenact those climates inside of boxes, and I grow trees. And I see if I was to bring a tree into that place, would it produce an amazing nut? But more importantly than that, how could we effectively use our climate data so that we see the world as a catalog of opportunity? a catalog of climate stresses that can be planted in it, planted within, and then say, oh, but what would it cost the environment if I did that? What would it create in terms of human nutrition, in terms of positive benefit? And if it doesn't win, we don't go there. This is the world that's starting to come to life. So I'll close with this. We put all of this out open source. That's the mission of my lab at MIT and the mission of my nonprofit. When I was here on stage last, I showed this in 2015. To be truthful, it was like half dream, half reality. I was like, ah, oh, Steve Jobs moment. Like, oh, yeah, we're all over the place. Um, made a lot of promises. People don't usually come back to the stage and like keep promises. So I'm here. Um, from that time, 2015 to today, these are individuals within our network in 65 countries across cultural barriers, across language barriers, across skill level barriers, all the things that people told me were impossible. They were like, you'll never get these crazy weird little machines in the hands of all these different people, and you're going to have to build all these huge organizations. And they were all wrong. And so as these people out there, makers, hackers, students, scientists, uh, homebodies, doesn't matter, come online, and they're looking for that digital interface to their agricultural future, we're building it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katie. So there you go, you know, technical genius and leadership is going to save us all from starving to death. And after a day like today, in these last five 
presentations. I sort of like to dream just into the near future and just imagine with you know, what's going on politically at the moment, if every time we came to vote for somebody, on the card or on the screen, it's, at the top, it said whether or not they'd attended a National Geographic Explorers Festival. <laughs> That would be great, because we'd instantly know their, their, their priorities and their goals and, their, and the things that meant something to them. And when it wasn't, there'd be a big flash up, big red card. Danger, danger, this person has not come. And that's the sort of future I see. Um, and we have to reflect now how lucky we are, because we operate within National Geographic with all the sponsors. You know, we've got sponsors and support, and we've got political influence, and we've got money, and we've got change makers, and we can do all that while we do all of our work. But if we imagine that all of that support was taken away, and I know you're listening, so please, please don't take it away. But if it was all taken away, we would still do what we do. There's nothing can stop us and the five you just saw from doing what we do. It's in us. It's the way we live our life. It's a life well lived. We just unstoppable. We just can't help ourselves. And that's why we do this. And I'd just like to celebrate that at this moment. Thanks very much. Hey. Thank, you, Danny. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was a great closing. <laughs> that was incredible. So we've, we've, thank you to all the speakers and to all of you listening out there in the courtyard. I know you're enjoying it. We're all coming there. So <laughs> that brings us to the closure of our day today. For all the explorers here in the room and for all of you out in the courtyard, there's a photographic fo photo opportunity at the 16th Street Stairs. So if all of you can assemble there, we're going to get a group photograph taken over there. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Done. Oh, you turned it off? OK. Ah, they can still hear me.